Welcome to continuing coverage of ESPN's Rivalry Week, presented by Remington. Dave Wanstead leads his Pitt Panthers on a perfect day in Heinz Field in downtown Pittsburgh. It's an emotional Saturday afternoon as it's senior day, and 18 Pitt Panthers will never walk on that field again. you got to love the smell of football in the fall in downtown Pittsburgh. And the Pitt Panthers can be a big player in the Big East race with a win today as they bring in their offense to take on the Louisville Cardinals. From Heinz Field in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Cars.com presents ESPN College Football, 8th-ranked Louisville seeking a 10th win and trying to get closer to the BCS, taking on the Pitt Panthers, who are 6-5 and five and have lost four in a row. Now, there has already been movement in the Big East today. Rutgers has won. Louisville, you see their position. West Virginia lost to South Florida. They need a ton of help to have any chance of winning the conference. And there you see Dave Wanstead's Pitt Panthers at 2-4. Welcome you to Pittsburgh. I'm Dave Lamont, along with Ray Bentley. Vince Welch will join us shortly. We, by the way, want to thank you for taking some time out of your family time to enjoy this football game today. We're excited about it, Ray, because we think offense is going to be on display. We've got guys we are very confident are going to make the next level. Yeah, and we'll start with Pittsburgh. Their quarterback, Tyler Palco, is having an outstanding year. He has vastly improved in terms of managing the football game. They tell him, throw it to the open guy or throw it away. He had a problem with that. Always tried to make something special happen. Now he has become more discipline in getting the ball to these two outstanding receivers. Kinder, a big play guy, can go up and get any football. And then Hoderick Turner is a guy that can just be steady, make runs after the catch, and use his big body to get things done. It's no surprise that Louisville has an explosive offense. They always do under Bobby Petrino. And this bunch captained by a guy who just looks like a Sunday quarterback. Yeah, Brian Brown is outstanding. He is healthy now, recovered from that thumb injury. He's got the zip back on the ball. He's your prototype, sit back in the pocket and pick him apart kind of guy. And then Harry Douglas is his favorite receiver, the leading Big East receiver in terms of yards. And he is a guy that can do it running after the catch. And then Mario Urudia is their big play guy. He's got an opportunity to take it all the way every time he gets his hands on the football. Now there are always the factors we look for in every football game offense defense special teams I mean, you factor in emotion today but there is a fifth factor that's going to be huge and earlier we caught up with Vince Welch who's going to explain the field. Normally, when talking about home field advantage, you're discussing that a little extra bit of energy that the home team gets from the enthusiasm of the fans. But today, it could literally be a home field advantage. There were four high school football games played on this surface last night. And earlier today, the grounds crew was out trying to cover up some of the dirt areas, particularly between the hash marks. And it literally is just a dirt area. And as you can see, there's a little bit of green cover, but it's nothing more than dirt here between the hash marks. The field can get slippery at this area of the surface as well. And Ray Bentley, I know that you believe that could play into the hands of the Pitt Panthers. Well, it could be a big factor because the Louisville team is built around speed. And when you have a, a questionable surface, slippery, muddy, or whatever it is, then the slower team has the advantage. In Pittsburgh's defense, they're mudders. They're a little slower. And I'm an old mudder myself, and I can tell you that may help them out a lot today, Dave. Well, so we'll see about this home field advantage as Senior Day being celebrated by the Pitt fans and quarterback Tyler Falco. Getting a lot of love from a good crowd here at Heinz Field in downtown Pittsburgh. Now we'll see what he does in the game next on ESPN's College Football. ESPN's College Football brought to you by Singular, raising the bar. Cooper Tires, don't give up a thing. And Remington Titanium Shavers. ESPN College Football is telecast is available on ESPN HD presented by Pioneer Plasma. Well, let's take a look at the coaching matchup today. Dave Wanstead, two times an NFL head coach with the Chicago Bears and the Miami Dolphins back at his alma mater. This is his hometown. He grew up about six miles from where the Pitt football facility is. And Bobby Petrino at Louisville, 38 and nine career record and on the road, 17 and eight. Well, and I was very impressed in talking with Dave Wanstad. He's got a good plan in place here to try and revitalize this Pitt Panther program. And 
He's just a bundle of excitement. He, you know, you wonder, you know, where's his mind at? Had been in the NFL, now in college football. He's as excited as he's ever been in terms of turning this program around. Well, you know, I'm not sure, Ray, that any other college program would have suited Dave Wanstead so soon after his NFL situation ran out on him. But as he, when he talked to us the other day, we were sitting in a room that used to be a steel mill where he and his father worked. I mean, that's how tied in he is to this area. Yeah, and he says it really helps him in terms of recruiting and just knowing everybody in this area. And if there's a good football player in Western Pennsylvania, Dave Wanstad expects to get him on his team. Well, we mentioned special teams for these teams. Both of them have the ability to take it to the house. Jawan Spillman, number 26, is a guy certainly worth watching. And Trent Guy is back there also. He does punt returns as well. Well. Take note of this, everybody. Now, Louisville's going to get the ball first, but Dave wants that promised us yesterday that Tyler Palco will not get sacked in the first quarter. So file that away. When Pitt gets the ball, we'll see if that holds up. Louisville's got a good defense, by the way. Gressel with a kick. And they'll say the heck with that. And let it go for the touchback. We'll bring out the Louisville Cardinals offense, and it's one of the best in the country. Brian Brom, the junior from Louisville, Kentucky. 15 and 3 as a starter. Number six all time total offense in this school's history. Big East player of the year last year. And fulfilling a dream, Dave. You know, he, he was back, grew up in the Louisville area, and, and had a chance to go to a lot of other different programs. But at the age of 12, had a dream that Louisville could be prominent in the national picture in terms of a national championship. And here he is, you know, get, getting close to living that dream. They start the game with stripling as the tailback. He'll get the first carry, and Pitt's defense will smother him for a loss. And there is HB Blades in there for Pitt. Nivia for men brings us to Louisville starting lineups. And we like to highlight the offensive line a lot of the times. And you found one guy in particular you're really fond of. Yeah, and that's the center, Eric Wood, who I think is an outstanding football player. He makes the calls up there. They'll pull him on toss sweeps. He's the guy that really, even though he's just a sophomore, makes all the calls and is the leader of that group up front. This is his 23rd straight start. Looking all the way toward Aritia, who made the catch, used his hands that time, I thought, very successfully. Kennard Cox, the quarterback, on the stop through him out of bounds, bring up third down after a seven-yard gain. Louisville on defense, and Ray, this is kind of an underrated unit, isn't it? Yeah, actually, the Pittsburgh defense we're looking sorry, at. Pittsburgh, you're right. And uh, you look at that defensive line, Dave, and that's where they have to really play well today. They've had a couple of injuries, so they've got younger guys that'll come in and fill in some of those spots. They need to hold that line up front and allow some of the faster guys to run to the football. Third down, they need about four. Colby Smith now into the tailback slot. Pressure up the middle, and it won't work. And on the coverage again, H.B. Blades, the outstanding senior linebacker from Plantation, Florida. A lot of Florida influence on this Pitt Panther team. And we talked to Paul Rhodes, the defensive coordinator for Pitt, and he said that Blades is a guy who really understands where he fits in terms of underneath coverage. And you're going to see where he fits. He's going to fit right there on your Rudia and knock that ball away, although I believe Mario might have dropped that one before Blades got there. Watch out here for Darrell Rebus. He has run back a punt for a touchdown. One of the most exciting plays in college football all season long. Getsky, that's a high kick. And Rebus will give Pitt decent field position at the 33-yard line following the 41-yard punt. Well, there's Tyler Palco, left-handed quarterback, two-time All-Big East honor rate, and he's got a chance to really pass an unbelievable name. If he gets 201 total yards today, he will pass Dan Marino into second place in the all-total yardage list. And he can't catch Alex Van Pelt, but that says a lot about Palco right there. Yeah, that's a pretty good name to be passing on any kind of list. Remember, Dave Wanstead said he will not be sacked in the first quarter, he being Palco. They're not going to get him here, I don't think. Or will they? 
Well, you talked about it, Ray, the open. He's learned to throw the ball no, away. Goes right, he'll throw it away if there's nothing there, and that's a key for him. Nivia for men brings us the pit offensive lineups. Of course, we talked about Tyler Palco, but you like these seniors. Yeah, I think Steve Dukas has come on and done a great job playing a tight end position, and then Joe Volani, the center, the leader up front there. Those are the three seniors for Pitt who are playing their last game for the Panthers. And Dave Wonstead told us when we met with him on Friday that he wished he could do more for these guys. This is Dave's second year with the Panthers as head coach. Stevens howling at the tailback, top of the eye. He's a small back and just sort of wiggled through that oh, nice hole to get nine. Bring up third down and short. And that's one of the advantages of being a smaller back. You can kind of squeeze through small holes. And that's what Stevens Howling does right here. You're going to see him go ahead and run it, fellas. He's just going to have a little bit of hold. The guard, big guard, pulls around, kicks out the outside linebacker. And right there, that hole kind of opened up late. But Stevens Howling was able to squeeze through there and get a nice game. He goes only 5'7", 175, a sophomore. Ran for 221 yards versus Syracuse earlier this season. Third and short for Pitt on their opening drive. Trying to go behind Collins, the fullback, a pretty good block, and that should be enough for the first half. All right, Stephen Howling, the ball carrier. Take a look at the Cardinals defense. And we mentioned this is an underrated Jackson. unit. There's so much on focus, the Ray, on the offense for Louisville, and understandably, but this is a good group. Yeah, just speed across the board. Yeah, These down. are the pass yeah. rushers that go in there. Jackson with seven sacks, Okoye with six sacks, and they just bring the pressure. Anderson had couple of sacks last week he's been injured but he has four sacks those are the guys that bring the heat and they have great speed along that front line we have a first down for the first time in this game and a little trickery didn't work it's really not working well that ball goes out of bounds and belongs to Louisville recovery looks like Jonathan Russell on the recovery that thing gets punched out late it's just a jet sweep type play. Going to hand it off quick. Try and race him to the corner. Is Pistano. And right there, it gets kicked out at the end. That was Pino Whitehead, Ray, who was added to the starting lineup today in place of Earl Haven. And he forced the fumble. Now, the crowd here is a little bit irritated. They thought this ball was out of bounds and it was recovered. And it will be reviewed by our referee, Gerald McGinn. Actually, he won't do the reviewing. Somebody in a booth will take care of that for him. Yeah, it's actually Nick Trainer is our replay official today. He'll be looking at it. But take another look at this. You see, he doesn't quite have possession, drops it, picks it up there. He's got that football inbounds, in my opinion. I don't blame him for reviewing it, but I think you're right. It looked like he had it. The ball doesn't touch the ground when he lands. And he, was, he was thinking about end zone there and forgot to tighten up the football first. Right there, you saw the eyes of John Russell look up for the field ahead of him and took him off the football just a split second too soon and that led to the bobble. Well one of the strangest stats you'll encounter in college ball as we wait for the ruling is the turnover difference between these teams. Pitt is plus 11 and maybe plus 10 if this review goes against them and they're six and five and they've lost four in a row. Louisville nine and one a top 10 team a top 10 team in the BCS. Well, they're even now, but that's amazing for a team that's 9-1 to be even in turnovers while the team that's plus 10 isn't. Yeah, sometimes that can be a, le a misleading statistic. Uh, most times not, but in this case it definitely is. And the, the thing for Louisville is they've got so many other things going for them that they don't necessarily have to win the turnover battle to win every game. That stripling goes into the tailback spot. Now they empty the backfield. He goes all the way to the far side. Plenty of time for Bob Arubia underneath. And he'll get it down to the 19-yard line before Revis knocked him down. That's a 22-yard pickup. And they had a linebacker trying to cover him underneath. You're going to see right here is Bennett. He's a linebacker. He's going to be looking outside, and he's going to chase Arubia across the field. You see, that's just a mismatch in speed. There's no way they can expect Bennett to track Arubia across the field all day long. Louisville has one of the country's best kickers in Art Carmody if they need it. Smith the tailback now. He and Stripling have been rotating a lot so far. And Smith trying to bounce to the outside. And he breaks the tackle. Trying to get to the end zone. 
Touchdown, Louisville. In two plays, they make Pitt pay for the turnover. Oh, a sloppy tackling by the Pitt Panther defense, which has kind of been inconsistent in terms of their tackling. And when they don't tackle well, boy, they have problems. We've already missed two tackles on this deal. I'll tell you, Ray, this play didn't look like it was going to go anywhere at first. Yeah, it almost looked as if uh, it was a, a bad play until so they pulled the guard away from where the running back went. He stopped and then cut it back the other way. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe they thought he didn't get into the end zone. So we'll go back to the review. Take a look ourselves and see if uh, he does get into the end zone or not. Colby Smith taking it outside. You see him make the move there, break the tackle. Let's see if that knee goes down before he gets in. I don't think so. The hand hit the ground, but nothing else hit the ground. I think that's going to be a touchdown. You see again, no, no elbows or arms, anything hitting the ground, just the hand. You can do that. That's going to be a touchdown. The last review didn't take very long. Uh, we guess this one won't be a very difficult decision either for the replay booth. Well, Dave Wanstead promised us no sacks. He didn't promise us no turnovers. <laughs> At the review, video confirms the call on the field. Touchdown is good. So Carmody on for the PAT. Try to make it 7 0 Louisville. This Louisville offense, you think of them as a, a pass offense, a team that likes to throw the ball, but they rush for over 190 a game as well. They're one of the more balanced offensive football teams in the nation. Actually, the only team, I think, Ray, to average 190 on the ground and 275 in the air. No other team in college football can do that. And you saw their quick strike ability. It only took two plays and 41 yards to put the Cardinals in front 7 0. You're watching college football on ESPN as we try to find out if Pitt can respond. Now, Pete Carroll has USC competing for another spot in the BCS championship game Saturday night. They face a tough task as Charlie Weiss's Fighting Irish head to the Coliseum. Saturday Night Football presented by Southwest Airlines as part of Rivalry Week. Presented by Remington and ABC. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. You see the history. Ray, the interesting story here is how this rivalry began on well, a train trip. Behind every great man, there's a greater woman. And Bonnie, Duke Rockney's wife, was convinced to visit, visit Southwest in California by the opposing coach's wife and that, that's what how things started way back then that's this is a honeydew game you do what the wife says <laughs> Flannery on the kickoff and Pitt will decide not to run it out well Pittsburgh one of the things they do very well is the first quarter they have been outstanding they've outscored their opponents by about 70 points they've only allowed three touchdowns and then this happened the run by Colby Smith just the fourth TD allowed in the first quarter this year yeah, and that was due to the turnover and then the sloppy tackling on defense. They have to get that fixed. If they can't, can't tackle well, this, this, this could be a, a blowout in favor of Louisville. The Pitt will try to recover. They try to trick play. They hand off to Pistano. That did not work for them. Wound up with a fumble. Louisville brings the blitz. Wide open. That's Lucas, and that is a Pitt first down. Tackle made by A. Brown. This is a nice job of picking up the blitz, first of all. John Russell, the free safety, is going to blitz. Here he is right up here coming in. And so now that tight end is going to come over the middle, and it's a zone blitz, so there's nobody really assigned to him. So the linebacker, A. Brown, has to sift through things and find him, and he did, but not until it was a first down. Lucas is senior. That's his 25th catch on the year. Quick toss out. It'll pick up about five or six. It looks like uh, O'Derek Turner on the catch. And the tackle made by William Gay. Well, Dave Wonstadt said, hey, we're not going to be sacked here in the first quarter. And one of the things he's going to do to avoid that sack is throw the one-step passing game. Stand up, pitch it out to the wide receiver as quick as possible. Get him one-on-one -on -one out there with a the corner and get what you can. Second down and four. You see Dave's numbers here at Pitt. Stevens Howling, the lone setback. Pretty much looks like the same play, different receiver. That's Kinder close to the marker. 
Yeah, and they'll move Kinder around to try and get matchups and put him in different spots. Usually he's the flanker. They'll move him over to split in where he was on that particular play. Sometimes he'll be in the slot, but he's the guy they really like in terms of the, the big play. You got a, a critical down, throw it to Kinder because if that ball's up in the air, he's going to go get it. That's his 47th catch on the year. He has six touchdowns. The average is about 17 yards a catch normally. That one is shorty, but it moves the chains. That six-man front up here for Louisville. What do you think that might mean? Means they're blitzing. They do. And Falco picks it up nicely. Gets to Kinder. He'll be a little short of the first down. He almost picked that thing up. Gain of nine on the play. Well, there's no question Tyler Falco is a better quarterback than last year. The numbers prove it, and his coach is convinced he's better. You know, really calmed his game down. He's, he's gotten a lot more focused on on what uh, what the big picture means. And, and anytime you have a quarter quarterback doing those things, you know, he's gonna give you a chance to, to win every week. Yeah. They want to measure for this first down, right? Yeah, and, I, and following up on Dave's comments about Tyler Palco, and it's, it's definitely, you can see the improvement in his game in terms of him not being such a, a cowboy, or as he called it, a linebacker mentality where he wants to tuck the ball and run a bigger guy over, or if something's not there, he's going to run around and force the ball in and try and make a big play. Sometimes that looks good, but most of the time, or even if you do it half the time and you make a mistake, that's bad news for your offense. That's not how the West Coast offense is, is run. And so what he's been able to do now is kind of, you know, if it's not there, eat the football or throw it away, not try to be a hero on every play. How much do you think the influence of Matt Cavanaugh, the pit offensive coordinator, is Elpon? A tremendous influence. In fact, that's the, the main reason. He convinced Palco that that's the route he had to take, and then they worked at it and worked at it and worked at it. And it really started to come together towards the end of last year. And this year, he's just been outstanding in terms of making his decisions and managing a game. You see the distance they need to get the Panthers for a first down. I think they're checking to a run play. Stevens Howling is the back. Or not. Yep, it is. Yeah, there you go. It is the first down and a lot more. Well, he does sort of squeeze his way through there. You kind of lose it. I mean, we, we have a pretty good view from up here, and I have a hard time finding it. Well, he's only 5'7", 170 pounds. This is, they do a nice job. You're going to see, go ahead and let it run, fellas, and they're, they're just going to get the fake real quick, and that kind of gets the linebackers out of there, and it gives the linemen a chance to get angles on their blocks and get up to that second level. And once they do that, then it's safeties and secondary people that have to make the play. That yeah, was Brandon Sharp on the stop after the 14-yard pickup. This formation here, yep. they got tight ends out wide. That's Jeff Ota, the left tackle, 76. That's a 340-pound receiver there. And they throw it to Kinder, not to Oda. I'm kind of disappointed. I don't know about you. <laughs> we want to welcome you to Heinz Field, everybody. Along with Ray Bentley and Vince Welch, I'm Dave Lamont. We're delighted you could make us part of your Thanksgiving weekend. Beautiful day here. Louisville trying to make it sixth grade over Pittsburgh. They have not been in this town since 1993. And, of course, it's senior day. 18 playing in their last home game including their fine quarterback for the Panthers, Tyler Palco. But Louisville's never seen the stadium. The last time they played here, the Panthers were on campus at ancient Pitt Stadium, which is now a memory. It's gone. Well, they've been picking on that side like crazy. What do they see over there, Ray? Well, what they see is a corner off just enough to, so that the receiver can catch the ball and have some room to go ahead and make a move before the tackle is commenced. So, you know, you get them off like that, then go ahead. And I, this is an automatic. Look at the, the, the space here. He gets five yards or more off, then you're going to go ahead and stand up and make that throw because that DB is going to backpedal his first couple steps anyway, and you're going to get four or five yards at least every time you do it as long as you make that completion. That was the freshman from Pahokee, Florida, T.J. Porter, only his third catch on the year. It's a nice little drive by Palco, spreading the ball around, mixing in some runs, making great decisions. Perfect so far. That's Kinder in motion. Looking that way. Well, you get the feeling, Ray, that he is going to break a tackle and make a big play. And that's what Kinder can do, but I'm telling you, Palco is an outstanding. He's doing very well right now, checking plays at the line and spreading it all over. Well, let's get down to the field and join Vince Welch, Vince. 
Guys, we're talking about Tyler Palco and his relationship with Matt Cavanaugh, the offensive coordinator. And Cavanaugh told us this week that Palco is as prepared and as smart as any player he's been around. Not only players at the collegiate level, but the pros, too. And Matt Cavanaugh has been around a lot of good football players. So that was about as high a compliment as he could pay the one he paid to Palco this week. Yeah, and Vince, he was a pretty good football player himself, too. Going to shot for the end zone. That great coverage that time by Gavin Smart. Well, let's get an update on Bedlam, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Head over to Reese Davis, Reese. All right, guys, Sooners and Pokes were tied at seven. Paul Thompson looking for Joaquin Iglesias to all the goals he's crossed before. Touchdown Sooners are up 13-7 at the half. All right, that's Bedlam version number 101 of meetings between those two schools. There's a look at Matt Cavanaugh. He also spent some time in the National Football League, but he too is a Pittsburgh guy. He was a quarterback of the National Championship team in 76. Big hit that time, knocked away by Malik Jackson. Actually, it was pretty hilarious when you had met up with Matt Cavanaugh yesterday. We, about the first thing that came out was. Uh, <laughs> Well, Matt was on that 1990 <laughs> New York Giants Super Bowl team that beat me and my Buffalo Bills, so I had to kind of get a shot in at him, let him know I hadn't forgotten. Well, this is a sight that Dave Wanstead wants no part of. Ellis Kinder shaking up. Yeah, and you see Malik Jackson making the shoulder hit into there to an exposed rib. Mm. That's Derek Kinder. I knew I would do that eventually. Work in the name of the 1940s Boston Red Sox pitcher, Ellis Kinder. Since I've gotten that out of the way, hopefully that won't happen again. I wouldn't have had that problem because I have no idea uh, who Alice Kinder might have been. You know, when you prepare, sometimes you get things stuck in your head, and that I knew was going to happen. So third down and ten. This is the first time on this drive that Pitt has seen third and long. And yeah, this is not where they want to be. They, they like third and six or less is what Dave wants that told us, a manageable situation. Bunched in, and Ender missing Kinder for this play, which certainly can't help. Open. Break a tackle, get a first down. I don't think he got it. Council on the stop for Louisville, and it is a definitive signal by the official fourth down. And they get a little high low action over on the corner. Watch this corner right up here. You're going to get a receiver going deep and then one underneath. And depending on what he does, that's Palco's read. If the corner gets back too far, like he does there, he's going to drop it underneath. If that corner were to come up underneath, then he'll throw that flag route to the corner. So it was an excellent read by Palco and a good job by Louisville to come up and make the tackle short of the sticks. And kicker Connor Lee is left on the bench, fourth down. Hey, it's senior day. Why not? First down. And Kinder, well, he got right back into the game and wrestles for an extra couple of yards before Gavin Smart tosses him out of bounds. And he is so physical, and that's what really makes this play work. This is really your old run and shoot offense. You see Palco just taking a kind of a, a three step drop on an angle towards the play side, and it's just a quick out route by the man on the end of the line of scrimmage, which is Kinder. And he is so physical with the player over him that he creates the separation needed to get that first down. Pittsburgh in the red zone this year 30 out of 34, 24 of those 30 scores. Touchdowns. Stevens Howling, the lone setback. Nice chance to get to the corner. Touchdown, Pitt. Well, we've been tracking missed tackles by Pittsburgh. There was one for Louisville that time. Well, I don't know if that was so much as a missed tackle as, as a broken tackle in terms of making somebody whip. What a cut by Stevens Holly. He looked like he was going to take it right up into the middle and an on a dime shot outside. The defender had no chance. Now they'll bring Connor Lee off the bench. And he'll kick for one instead of three. So going for it on fourth down pays off for the Panthers. And they're a moment away from evening up this game. Straight down the middle of the fairway, 7-7 seven, seven with 6.37 to go in the first quarter. We're getting the kind of offense we thought we might. Steven Howling zips through, and we are even up now. The ball is in Louisville's court on ESPN's College Football.
ESPN's College Football is presented by Cars.com. Find the right car for you. Cars.com. And in part by the Volkswagen Jetta. Safe happens. Well, there is the cathedral on the University of Pittsburgh campus in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is a downtown school pretty much. Just a couple of miles away from the downtown area where a Thanksgiving parade was held this morning. There's our score and time. And kickoff taken by Spillman. He's dangerous. Not there, though. Well, he got dumped. Nice hit made there by Giovanni Chappelle. Beautifully done. Only a 16-yard return. Stevens Howling picked up his 10th touchdown of the year. That is a perfect drive, right? Boy, outstanding drive. And Dave Wanstead said, hey, we're not going to get sacked. And they didn't. And the reason was all the one-step drops, the quick out passing that they threw. They, they did a couple of three steps, a couple of play action. Mix it up. You didn't see any seven-step drops out of that Pitt Panther offense in that drive. Colby Smith is the setback. He and Stripling have pretty much traded off play. Smith has a touchdown. But the card put the ball on the ground. And it's Pitts. Well, he just flat dropped the football. And looks like Sam Bryant came up with it the strong safety. Uh, get the momentum going here in Heinz Field for the Pitt Panthers. You see the handoff just didn't get far enough into the belly. And I got to put that one on Brown. You got to put that ball all the way in there. Looks like he left it on the hip a little bit. Well, there you see, this is a top 10 team that has not been able to hang out of the ball lately. And now we are even in turnovers. Louisville turns pit mistakes, turns Pitt's mistake into a touchdown. Now we'll see what the Panthers can do. They go on the reverse with Kinder. He's going to oh, throw. Yeah. Wide open touchdown, Pittsburgh. 21 yards to oh, Derek Turner. And they went to the razzle-dazzle there. They had a couple things going for them. Number one, they're in the red zone, and then right off a turnover, you go ahead and take a chance. They, you know, take a shot. They went the reverse pass, and it was wide open. Louisville nowhere near. Kinder. Lee on for the PAT. Kick is good. Take another look at this razzle dazzle, and you can see the man in motion right there is Kinder, and there's nobody by him. And finally, the pressure comes up in that corner. When that corner came up, Kinder knew that he wasn't going to be back there to cover Turner. Here's Turner right here. You're going to see the eyes of the defender over there, Gay, looking inside, and then he bit up on the run fake, on the reverse fake, did not stay with his man. A cardinal sin by the Cardinals. Score in time. There's go Derek Turner, who caught his seventh touchdown pass of the year. But the first time he's caught one from Derek Kinder, I can assure you. As Pittsburgh leads Louisville 14 to seven. Oh, we talked about this already, Ray, about the turnover situation with Pitt being so good and Louisville being so poor, and that is unbelievable that they can have a nine one record and be minus one. Well, that shows you that they're very good at other things, but it also shows you, boy, we could be so much better if we protected the football and then took it away. You know, their fumbles against Rutgers really is what what hurt them when they lost that ball game. And a fumble here puts the Panthers in front 14 to seven. This will be returned to Spillman. He's dangerous now. Number 10 in the NCAA in kick returns. Looking for a hole. He's got one. And a saving tackle for the Pitt Panthers that Spillman time by Reggie return. Carter. Number 21 who saved the tackle after a 35-yard return. Tripped up by number 21. Guys, uh, Dave Wanstead was uh, talking to us earlier this week about his seniors, and even though this is a group that he has not recruited here to Pittsburgh, he talked about how much he wanted to win this game for that group. Only 12 seniors on this Pitt team, and Wanstead has grown to love each and every one of them. He says he wants to get this game so they'll get a bowl game or a better bowl game and also give them the opportunity to showcase their skills a little bit more. And uh, he is really outspoken in that regard as to what the seniors, even though there's only 12 of them, what they mean to this program. 
All right, thank you, Vince. A short game there on the pass to Colby Smith. Brom had plenty of time to scout out his options, but good coverage that time by the Panthers' D. Yeah, it was a real late developing route, so he needed that time, but it was so covered up down the field, he had to dump it off. And then I was impressed with the pursuit of the Panther defense getting after it. Of course, those seniors that Dave Wanstead is so fond of were not the players that he recruited. Walt Harris, who's now the head coach at Stanford, brought those guys in. But Dave grew to like them very, very quickly. Not much of a game that time for the uh, Cardinals. Brings up third down, and they'll have about five or six, looks like. So Clemon and, among others, on the stock, Rashad Duncan also making the stop. You see Bobby Petrino over there signaling in the plays. His brother Paul Petrino is upstairs in the booth, and he kind of makes suggestions, and then Bobby will make the final decision on what play he wants. And when we talked to Paul Petrino, he said, you know what, He's, that's the one thing my brother does really well. He can call some plays now. They empty the backfield. Down the middle. Great catch that time. That's Harry Douglas. Brian Bennett on the stop, but Douglas got in front of his man and makes the catch. First down, Louisville. Just an outstanding throw from Jeff Brom. It's just going to be, you're going to see, it's going to be man-to-man -man coverage. Blades, the linebacker, is going to head over this way. So you know it's man-to-man -man across the board. And you're going to get just a great move by Douglas to get inside his defender. And again, they got him matched up on Brian Bennett, number 44, a linebacker. You cannot survive trying to cover Pitts, or excuse me, Louisville's receivers with linebackers. Looks like they faked a little bit of an option to go back to Smith, who cuts back right through the middle of the field. Looks like he has carried it for a first down for the Cardinals. That's an 11 yard pickup. Tackle made by Gus Lustigas. And that's just a little misdirection draw play because uh, obviously Louisville is seeing that the Pitt Panther defense is fired up right now. They're flying to the football. So you want to hit them with a little misdirection, try and gash them that way, and it's pretty successful. Louisville makes things happen in bunches. They do it quickly. Good play action. Might be looking at Douglas again. He is, and it's a Louisville touchdown. Boy, that was so easy. Well, again, a misdirection. Brown rolls to the right, sets up, and throws all the way back against the grain, and the receiver. Wide open for that touchdown, and we got a late flag on this. And this touchdown will not count because there is a holding call against Louisville. Wipe it out. It never happened. Legal block in the back. On the offense. Number 33. 10-yard penalty from the previous line of scrimmage. Replay first down. That's Colby Smith. Colby Smith was the, the tailback in this in that last setup. It's hard to kind of see it from this look right now, but right there it is. Right there, you see, pushed him in the back at the end, and he's outside of that clip zone, which is right at the line of scrimmage. When you get back behind the line of scrimmage, you cannot hit somebody in the back. So forget about that touchdown. Instead, it's going to be first down at 20. Make the screen to one back. Go to the next underneath. Big hit. And that's Blades on the stop. Not a surprise to see that. Spillman was the receiver. And it's Betty Blades, former Miami Hurricane and a longtime NFL star. That's HB's father. Take a look at this play at the end. Blades in the middle in his zone coverage. Comes up and puts a little plastic on Harry Douglas. Well, Blades, if he has a huge day, will pass another pit immortal. We'll tell you about that in a moment for all-time tackles. This is Smith. They could have used Blades on that one. Breaks the tackle almost. He actually dragged Jameel Brady quite a ways, 10 yards on the carry. But if a huge day happens for H.B. Blades, 19 tackles, he'll pass Hugh Green on the all-time tackles list for second place. Here is H.B. and his dad. Emotional moment for the Blades family there. Everybody knows Benny Blades played at Miami. Was an All-American there, won a national championship. A lot of people thought his son would go to Miami. He said he felt more like a Pittsburgh guy when he came up here. Was comfortable, blue-collar type guy. He said he'd fit in better here. We're behind the receiver. That'll bring up fourth down at about eight. 
Well, H.B. Blades is from South Florida, but this is his kind of town. Well, he said, I feel that way, blue collar. You bring your hard hat to work. He loves the city and the atmosphere. So the people here love the game of football, and that's why he came here. It's going to be his last opportunity to play today, and it's going to be an emotional one. And you saw some of the emotion when he hugged his father, and you see the emotion in the way he's playing this ball game. Carmody is on, and he has made 15 consecutive field goals. He is a Lou Groza Award finalist. And he tucks that one into bed nicely. So Louisville gets on the board. They had six. It was taken away by a penalty. So Pittsburgh maintains the lead with 159 to go, 14 to 10 after the field goal by Carmody, the all-time leading scorer. You know, when we talked to HB, he and his father really weren't that close as he was growing up. Right. In fact, he lived with his grandparents and down in Florida. And, and until Benny retired, he really didn't live with his father, didn't see him that much, but he said now after he retired, he moved in with him and he was able to kind of hang around and he was in the Lions locker room and, you know, talk to Chris Spielman and Barry Sanders and those kind of guys as a kid growing up said he really learned a lot from that situation and he's really become a lot closer with his father since they've moved in together. And also another big influence in his life was his uncle Al Blades, who was tragically killed in a car accident a while back and uh, certainly a void in HB's life. I know he misses him terribly, but uh, that's quite a set of bloodlines in that group for football players. Well, you know, you got the USC Notre Dame game on ABC, but if you like to watch a great ACC battle with a lot at stake, we got it for you tonight at 745 on ESPN at 745 Eastern, of course. Wake Forest continues fighting for the ACC Atlantic Division. What a story. As they visit Maryland, college football primetime, part of Rivalry Week, presented by Remington on ESPN Saturday at 745 Eastern and also available in high definition on ESPN HD. And for more information, you can always log on to ESPN.com. Robinson and Porter back deep. Robinson third in the NCAA in kick returns, and he'll get a chance. And good coverage that time by the Cardinals special teams. Only a 21-yard return. The hit made there by Lamar Miles. And Benny Blades has joined Vince Welch. Vince? Well, Benny, we saw that uh, video of HB coming out and uh, greeting you here on uh, Senior Day. What emotions are going through your mind there? Uh, I was telling his mom, uh, I can't believe it's been four years. You know, it's been incredible four years for him, you know what I mean? You know, he almost made me cheer up. I'm not an emotional guy. I mean, he's enjoyed his four years here, and I, I wish him nothing but the best. We're going to watch this play here and come back to uh, Benny. Well, time's running out on Palco's no sack guarantee as he finds Stephen Howlings, and even though Stephen Howlings Falcons is small, they found him for his short game, Vince. What do you think of when you watch Ben uh, HB play? Does he remind you of yourself at all? A lot of myself. You know, the thing is, um, I see some of the things that he does, and I'm, I'm, I'm in awe. You know, the thing is, it's almost like looking at yourself in, in, in the mirror, saying, "Man, he's gonna be, he's gonna be good." You know, especially at that next level. You know, he's gonna have some of those big guys protecting him. And I tell him, "Hey, you're gonna have you know, a lot of football to left." Yeah, good to see you, Benny. All right, thank you. All right, Vince, thank you much. And there is a play that Pitt has gone to now five times. Kinder mainly on the catch, and he gets it out to where he third down and short. Abe Brown on the stop. Well, there you see Benny and HB's mom. We talked about where HB ranks in the all-time tackles lead. You know, there have been some studs who have played at pit rank. Yeah, there, there have. And you look at this list and see Hugh Green is the one he's kind of closing in on. He has 19 tackles today. He'll pass Hugh Green for second all-time. And he said, boy, that would mean a lot to me because everybody knows what a great player Hugh Green was. You see his picture up all over the place at their facility. And he just felt that that would be a, a monumental accomplishment. Third down and short, and this time, Stephen Howling is just hauled down by Malik Jackson for a loss on the play. And for the first time today, Pitts Panthers will be forced to punt, but they'll do that when the second quarter starts. No sacks. You're right. They got away with that. And they also get out of this first quarter with the lead. Now Louisville's going to get the ball back. Pittsburgh leads this one after one, 14 to 10. You're watching college football on ESPN.
start of the second quarter about to happen here in Heinz Field in downtown Pittsburgh with Ray Bentley and Fitz Welch is on the field. I'm Dave Lamont. What do you take out of the first quarter with the Panthers in front of you? Uh, I think the Panthers are playing outstanding. You know, they forced that turnover, capitalized right away. But prior to that, an 80-yard drive with Tyler Palco putting the ball all over the place where he needed to. They played very well, and defensively, they've held up. They got a break getting that penalty on that touchdown, but so far, so good. We talked at the top of the show with Vince about the field conditions after this punt here by Gressel. I'd like to find out what you think of it so far because the field here took a beating yesterday. Tough snap and a funny looking little kick. This might roll a lot though. You got some room here. Spillman. He'll take this into Panthers territory. So excellent field Spillman position for the Cardinals, Cardinals here. And Ray, what do you think? How do you think this field has held up so far after four high school games yesterday? I think it's held up pretty dang good, as a matter of fact. You know, when I went walked out on it earlier, the thing about it is they rolled it, so it's a very hard surface. And even though you, you have dirt, as long as it's not mud, you're going to be all right. And, you know, it might get chewed up, might, you know, we'll stick around, see what happens later on as they continue to play. But so far, so good. I have not seen a lot of slippage. Well, Louisville's one touchdown drive was a short field. And they have a short field here down the middle of Rutia, wide open. He'll just walk into the end zone. That is a 42 yard touchdown pass. And again, they made it look really easy. Well, the key was the great protection. I mean, Brian Brown, he got, he just sat in there, sat in there, and waited and waited. And finally, Rutia came across and beat Jamel Brady on a kind of an inside post cut. And Brady just didn't have the speed to hang with it. And that was a concern, I think, for Pitt, realizing they're just not as fast as the Cardinals are. Right? You try to, you know, manufacture speed. You do different things to try and do that. But the, at the end of the day, you got to be able to cover their guy when he's running down the field like that. Good snap on the PAT. And now Louisville has taken back the lead they had early in the first quarter, 17 to 14. It's Brom and Arutia hooking up yet again for the Louisville Cardinals. Now we'll see if Tyler Palco and the Pitt Panthers can counter when we come back. This is ESPN's College Football, presented by Cars.com. We're back. Let's take a look at that last touchdown. Here's Arutia right here in the safety. Brady right up there. Now you're going to see Brady. They got him stacked coming down the field. He got too wide and wasn't able to recover when Yerudia made that inside cut. He's got to stay a little bit more inside because that's his area of the field. He just got too wide and it allowed the room for Brom to throw that dart in there. And that allowed Louisville to go back in front 17 to 14. He's Ray Bentley. My Dave Lamont. Vince Welch is on the sidelines. An absolutely perfect day in downtown Pittsburgh. Low 60s and no threat of rain. Chance here again. Looks like Robinson. Couple of nice cutbacks, but Louisville with a fine job on coverage. Let's get more on Bedlam 101. Let's go to Reese. All right, guys. Oklahoma trying to make its way to the Big 12 championship game. Taco Bell Studio update. Alan Patrick making a run for Kansas City. 65 yards to put the Sooners up 20 to 7, but the Pokes just answered. Extra point pending. It is now 20 to 14 in the third quarter. All right, Reese, thank you very much. How about the play of Patrick with uh, the loss of Adrian Peterson? He stepped his game up right there, and it also tells you that they, uh, they've got a pretty good offensive line. How about that with Kinder, the one-hander. Gain of 19. And watching film on Kinder, I saw a bunch of plays like this. He's got circus catch ability. Here he is, he's gonna run a post route, kind of just stick it inside, and then the ball's thrown behind him a little bit by Palco, but he just one-hands that thing and brings it in. And he can make that kind of play on a regular basis. And a free safety, John Russell on the stop. You take a look at Kinder, a junior from Albion, New York, but I'm sure the NFL scouts are all over him. Of course, the funny thing is the Panthers actually share a facility with the Steelers, but they really aren't allowed to speak. So to speak. Right. There's that fake again on that little side screen, and Palco just pitches it over into the Louisville trainers area, so it brings up second down and 10. Yeah, NCAA rules really won't permit any contact. I'm sure accidentally if somebody will bump into somebody, a coach or a player, but no real formal contact is allowed. Right, and they share the complex, so I mean, it, 
Well, the, all you, you have to do is look out the window and see each other, but <laughs> I suppose they don't have contact. No. So Tyler Balco with Stevens Howling, the lone setback. Balco hasn't thrown a touchdown pass yet, but Derek Kinder has. And it's Kinder again. He's done about everything. Gets it right to midfield. That's a gain of nine. Kinder. Well, I know everyone's anxious about that. Some of our crew is pretty anxious about this game. Pete Carroll has USC competing for another spot of the BCS championship game. Tonight, they face a tough task, and Charlie Weiss brings the Fighting Irish out to California. Saturday Night Football presented by Southwest Airlines as part of Rivalry Week presented by Remington on ABC, and you can always get more information by going to ESPN.com. Pete Carroll has not lost a game in November since he went out to Los Angeles, 19-0. That's pretty good. Stevens Howling, and that's the first down. Look, well, I don't know. Boy, I thought he had it, Ray. You know what? Look at the spot. Well, that's the thing about having a, a five foot seven, 175 pound tailback. When you need a yard, he's not the guy that can push the pile. And you know, I'm surprised they don't work somebody else. They've used Kevin Collier a little bit, and Shane Brooks a little bit back there. But, you know, when you have to push the pile in order to get the chains, I don't know if you want to put the little guy in there and have him try that. Conrich Collins, the fullback, goes 235, the sophomore from Miami, whose father played in the NFL, Tony Collins. But based on what we all see, the yellow line, which the referee does not have the benefit of, that's all they have to do. Now, Dave went for it on fourth down and that's one, sure. deep in Louisville territory, and succeeded. And he's going to stay in the game, Ray. Well, I think he realizes he's in a little bit of a track meet right now because they haven't been able to stop Louisville that much here since the first series or so. So he said, you know what, if it's a track meet, then I got to keep running. And Collins, the fullback, Andrews does come in. It looks like that's the first down. Yeah, and I like the quick count. You saw Palco looking around and then quickly ducked his hands under there and got the snap right away. And when you do that, it gives your offensive line a little bit more momentum. It gives the quarterback momentum, and you can push it forward and get those precious inches that you need. Isn't that the Peyton Manning goose sneak that they call it, Indy? It's similar to that. The, the goose sneak, you, you go on the, you know, when the quarterback puts the pressure on the center, he'll snap the football. But I think on this one, he gave a snap count so everybody could fire out. And Bobby Petrino not terribly happy with his defensive line that time. Bobby's not a happy guy a lot of times. He's intense. Yes, he, he is. is. And it bodes well for him. Stevens Howling, and he didn't get very far at all that time. Howling, the Looked like Moby Okoye, the senior from Huntsville, Alabama, by way of Nigeria, came in on the stop. Had to stop for the well, Vince, this is one of the most fascinating stories in all of college football, the Koye's development. Yeah, it's just absolutely amazing. He signed a college scholarship at the age of 15 and played in his first game for Louisville at age 16. His family moved from Nigeria to Huntsville, Alabama when he was 12. Very smart kid, skipped a grade in school when he made the transition to the U.S. And when he came to Louisville, it was assumed he'd be a redshirt, but he was just too good to keep off the field, even at the age of 16 as a freshman. Underneath, this is Collins and a first down for the Panthers and a whole lot more down to the 14 yard line before the hit is finally made by A. Brown. Well, that was just a nice job right there of Palco waiting for him to clear. And then Malik Jackson had the coverage on Collins, but he's going to get him here. You're going to see the, the back's going to sneak out here. And here's the man that's got coverage on him. He's going to get inside leverage. And when you get the inside leverage, Actually, it was the outside back of the head of coverage, but he had inside leverage on Jackson. And when you got him inside, boy, you get the ball, you're going to run away from him just like you did there because you don't have the sideline to help slow things down for you. Well, the track meet you alluded to is well underway. You see what the Panthers have done on first down. Very successful. Stevens Howling trying to keep that streak alive. How about the stiff oh, arm? Stevens and he got it down to about the nine as he just stuck his hand right in the grill of John Russell and kept going. Well, you know what? We talked about how small he is, but he plays bigger than what he is. And you're going to see this, an example of the strength that he has. Number one, he breaks the tackle. And then now, in a much bigger man, he throws that stiff arm on him and is able to get four or five more yards afterwards. Preston Smith also had to come in to finish him off. His first down has been very helpful for the Panthers so far. 
Yeah, that, this is they mixed it up too. You see, six times on first down they've thrown and they've been successful with it, and that's very important to them. And Ellis, uh, yeah, Derek Kinder, there I go again with a baseball reference. Timeout. Derek Timeout. Kinder is the one who called Pitt timeout. Pitt so Pitt so Pitt he really Pitt has Pitt done Pitt everything Pitt on this field for the Pitt Panthers. He's caught passes. He's thrown a touchdown pass. Matt Cavanaugh wants to talk to Tyler Falco and see what he can come up with. Pitt in great shape right now. In the distance, you see downtown Pittsburgh. That's how close we are. Time for the game track for today, presented by John Hancock with the Cardinals in front 7 0. Leron Stevens Howling scores on this six yard run to even things up. Then, after a turnover, how about this little trick play? It's Kinder to Turner, and it's a pit touchdown. The Panthers go in front 14 to 7. However, on Louisville's last possession, Brian Brom's ninth touchdown pass of the year, a wide open Mario Rutia, and the Cardinals retake the lead 17 to 14. But Look where we are now. It's senior day, probably for some of the band members as well, and the cheerleading squads, but there's the Panthers, second down and four. And we have all sorts of problems before this play ever got off. Yeah, they tried to snap the ball to catch the Cardinals off sides. They weren't sure if they did. Some of them continued to play, some of them didn't, and then they blew the whistle to stop it. Gerard McGinn. Gerard McGinn is our referee. All Big East crew, of course. You know, you see that a lot of times the center. He's told if, if they're in the neutral zone, they jump across, quick snap the ball, and we'll take a knee and get them off sides. And you saw Palco almost take a knee and then thought better. Dead of ball. It. Dead ball. Ball start on the offense. Number 68. Five yard penalty. Remain second down. And Dave wants that one. So how can that be? The 10 33. He wants to know is who is it on. It's on Joe Villani, who the center, making his 23rd straight start, a senior from Wonton, New York, a walk-on transfer from Bucknell, who played his way into a scholarship. So now it's second down and just about 10. That's kind of a dubious call in the sense that if, when the center moves, that's when the play starts. He's the guy that gets it going. <laughs> he can't be uh, illegally proceeding. Yeah, they might have missed a number on that then. Well, they said Brom wouldn't be sacked in the first quarter, and he wasn't, pardon me, Palco, but Palco goes down here in the first Louisville sack of the afternoon, and all of a sudden what looked like second and four a little while ago is now turned into third and very long. Preston Smith in there for the Cardinals. Well, they brought the house on this one. You're going to see that open up. Okoye gets instant pressure. He actually got there first, and then the blitzers showed up afterwards piling on top. Yeah, Okoye really collapsed that pocket, didn't he? He's so quick and then he's so strong. He just he kind of get himself sideways, grab a hold of you and throw you out of the way, and then he's gone before you know it. 6 1, 3 17. Drop by Collins. They lose the chains a bit and will set up Connor Lee for the field goal. Nate Harris on the stop. Nate Harris has the stop. Got two very good kickers in here. Carmody for Louisville has made 16 straight field goals, and Connor Lee is 11 out of 13 on the year. Fourth down, Connor Lee. It's kind of a conservative Lee call Lee. by Dave Wanstead on that third and long. He just didn't want to maybe you know, create a problem for himself, come away and definitely get points and tie this ball game. This will be a 30 yard attempt. The putter, Gressel, is also the holder. And we are tied. 31 yard, field 30 yard is kick good. is good for Connor Lee. He's 12 out of 14 on the year. And Dave Wanstead has got his team even with the eighth ranked Louisville Cardinals. Well, let's go down to the sidelines and Vince Welch. Well, Ray was just saying that he thought that play was a bit conservative, and Tyler Palco, the quarterback for Pitt, agreed. He came off the field screaming at offensive coordinator Matt Cavanaugh. They exchanged words. Cavanaugh chose to let Palco continue on to the bench, but there's no question that Palco was not happy with that call and that selection of a, a conservative call, if you will. Yeah, you know, those guys have the relationship where they can, you know, that stuff not going to affect them down the road. They've been at it now for two years together, and they got great respect and admiration for each other. And you can kind of, you know, go back and forth like that, and it's, it's no big deal. 
Well, and you know, uh, Ray, I thought it was interesting how uh, Matt Cavanaugh said yesterday when we were talking to him, it's a thin line between being understanding of the challenges that the quarterback faces and then at the same time being critical of the plays that the quarterback doesn't make. And he says sometimes they go back and forth over that line, but in general, they've got a really good relationship to where they are able to kind of air out some differences, as you said, and, and uh, they were definitely airing out their differences just a moment ago. And you have to have that kind of relationship in order to be successful because this is a highly intense uh, game and, and there's so much time and preparation that goes into it and it means so much to them that you have to be able to have your spats and then immediately move on. This is Spillman at the goal line. Running straight ahead. Didn't make one cutback and got decent field position out of that. About a 25-yard return. Time for our Aflac trivia question. We like this one, but I'm so proud of myself. I got it right. Who is the only other player besides Tony Dorsett to win a Heisman, a national championship, and a Super Bowl, and be voted into both the college and pro football halls of fame? Want to find an anyone to cheat and impress your friends? Go to page 711 of the ESPN College Football Encyclopedia. We will give you a moment to do that. Now, do you know who this is? Yes, I do, because I was there when you guessed it correctly. <laughs> okay, I was trying to set you up there. <laughs> no, no thanks. Just this once I was trying anyway. Colby Smith, the tailback for the Cardinals. And Pitt doing a good job that time. They struck that play out. Joe Clermont and H.B. Blades in there. Well, Louisville has not been perfect today at all. Right? Now they made some mistakes in terms of tackling. Seven missed tackles, dropped a pass. They got the turnover and then just one penalty. That's not too bad for, you know, a quarter and a half. But the seven missed tackles, that's unconscionable. You can't miss that many tackles in this amount of time. You have to start tackling better. Second and long for Bobby Petrino's team. Stripling in the game out wide from his regular tailback spot. Brom winds up, hits Arudia, that's right at the marker. Brom's pass complete to number seven. Well, they continue to have a heck of a game between OU and OES, OSU. Let's go to Reese Davis. All right, guys, checking in once again on that rivalry, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Chris Brown going in for the Sooners, who are trying to make the Big 12 championship game win, and they're in 27 14, getting late in the third there. Georgia Tech and Georgia clean old-fashioned hate, they call it. Jackets up by three just before halftime. That's for the Governor's Cup, of course. Thank you, Reese. It is a first down for the Cardinals. Anthony Allen gets into the tailback spot right now and gets the carry. Rubel loves to rotate those tailbacks. He's a freshman from Tampa. He's run for over 300 yards this season. All right, well, we gave you time to go look this one up if you have the ESPN College Football Encyclopedia. A great Christmas gift if you don't. Now, who is the only other player besides Tony Dorsett to win the Heisman, a national championship, a Super Bowl, and make the college and pro football halls of fame? It would be USC's Marcus Allen. You might see him on the sidelines tonight patrolling the Notre Dame plays the Trojans and the Coliseum. It'll be a first down for the Cardinals. Again, Allen, the running back. And Allen, the runner again. Rashad it's Duncan, a sophomore from Belgrade, Belgrade, Florida. So many Floridians on this Pitt Panther team. And you think, well, because Dave Wastad was on the Dolphins. No, no, Walt Harris got a lot of those guys. Yeah, and a lot of people go in there because there's so many excellent high school football players down there. And, you know, one of them is Anthony Allen, who's just gotten the ball a couple times in a row. And I've been greatly impressed with him and the limited time that he's had in this backfield. He's proved to be a, quite a weapon. They send Stripling out wide. Bomb to Rutia. They're having a hard time stopping him inside the 10. Boy, he just ran past Kennard Cox. That was, that was just your old-fashioned go route. Just run down the field as fast as you can, and I'll throw it to you. And that's exactly what they did. Watch the speed right here. It's kind of a, a press right there. Kennard doesn't really alter the route with the, with the hands on him. He, Kind of step for step. He never got his head turned around to look for the ball, but his Rudy is his raw speed that blew past him and enabled this play to work for for uh, Louisville. And then the throw by Brown was just perfect. 43 yards, and Allen is back into the tailback spot. Stretch play, and it does not work at all. And who else but HB Blades? Nice play by Blade sneaking in behind the blocking up, up the front and then hitting that open window and then angling to make the play. And that, that's what a good inside linebacker will do. A lot of guys can run up through there 
and make it look like they did something. He's able to make the angles to make those plays. Well, we've talked about the field. Let's take a look at it. Whoop. That's Douglas. And that's on the outside where the field isn't chewed up. Right. You see right there in the center, if you're wondering why it looks so bad, we'll explain here in a moment. That is nothing going on there. Phillips got in there and really delivered the blow to slow that play down. Four high school playoff games were played at Heinz Field on Friday, starting at 10.30 in the morning, and they didn't finish till about 10.30 Friday night. And, you, and thank goodness there's no rain, because if we had rain in the last 24 hours or so, this thing would be a quagmire. Third down and goal from the nine. Stripling the tailback. Four receivers for Brom to choose from. To the end zone. Touchdown, Louisville. They go to the tight end, Barnage, and the Cardinals are back in front. This is just a nice job of Barnage continuing to work. When your quarterback gets flushed, he's a scrambled, he's out on the perimeter. He's going to keep working. Here's Barnage right there in the slot. Watch him. He's going to get outside, and he sees, all right, my quarterback's working. i got to keep working. And the defender totally lost track of him. That's Clint Session, that linebacker, outside linebacker. And you got to plaster when you get that situation. That means you find a receiver, and you plaster to him when that quarterback's scrambling. The PAT, low but good, and Louisville retakes the lead. We have been, as we thought we might be, back and forth with offense. Now, can they watch that Panthers do something against Bobby Petrino's defense? We'll find out what they return from Pittsburgh. ESPN's College Football, brought to you by the Nissan Titan, proud presenter of the 2006 Heisman, and Aflac, ask about it at work. That is the left field fence from the old Forbes Field, former home of the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1960. Famously, Bill Mazeroski knocked one over Yogi Berra's head and over that fence to give the Pirates a World Series championship. Where is that fence now? It is on the Pitt campus. Our little history here because the Pirates' new stadium, just a little walk away from where we are, and the Steelers. Pretty much brand spanking new facility. A lot of history in this town, of course, for professional sports and college sports. Pitt has nine national championships. Last one, though, was 1976. This is TJ Porter. And trying to have yeah, boy, <laughs> trying to break that one tackle. He set himself up for a big hit from Steven Gar, number 23. Well, let's take a look. We talked these quarterbacks. We talked about them yesterday. We talked about them today. What do you think? I think both of them are playing very well, and you see the yardage pretty close. Brown with a couple of touchdown passes, but the thing is they've both been getting great protection. Brown has not been hit yet, not been sacked, and Palco has been hit once and sacked just once. So they're, they're getting the time to do their thing, and when they get that, they will throw the ball down the field and make plays. But there's also no question that Falco and his guys have got to answer. Three and out here could be really deadly the way Louisville has moved the ball and used mismatches. Insignificant gain, a couple of yards there. And that is Kevin Collier, the freshman from Rochester, getting a chance to get in there, the third string tailback. And they said they were going to try and use him a little bit more often. Matt Cavanaugh told us he's kind of an in between guy as far as a guy that, you know, is not so small like Stevens Howling. But yet he's a little bigger that he can push piles and he can run with a little more power. He's a nice change up for him. Yeah, you saw facing the sidelines there. One of the co-defensive coordinators for Louisville. It's Mike Cassidy who also handles the safeties. Louisville with two defensive coordinators, but only one guy calling plays, and that's Bobby Petrino. Screen set a ball away for Collier. Good job that time by the defender. He didn't buy any of those shoulder shakes. No, and that was a five-step drop right there by Tyler Palco. And there hasn't been a whole lot of deeper drops for him in this offense. That's what Dave Wanstead was telling us. We're going to we're not going to get Pat, uh, sacked because we're going to get rid of the ball quickly. You look at that six times one step drop, six three step, couple of play actions, just one time a five step and just one time a seven step. So that's why Palco has had you know some success and hasn't been harried by the pass rush that much as Louisville's blitz now eight times today but they've only gotten home once yeah, that was William Gay who made that fine stop setting up third down and five empty backfield for the Panthers 
And Louisville just rushes four. And that allowed Falco to find his man. First down for Ben. That is Marcel Pistano on the catch. Now, we've talked a lot about the Irish and the Trojans, but for a spot in the ACC championship game, how about Wake Forest, Demon Deacons, and the Maryland Terrapins, two of the biggest surprises in the ACC. 7.45 Eastern on ESPN tonight. They fight for the Atlantic Division title. College football primetime part of Rivalry Week presented by Remington on ESPN tonight at 7.45 Eastern. Also available in high definition on ESPN HD. And for more information, of course, log on to ESPN.com. Paul, those numbers very strong. 80% completion right now. Well, he's done that before. His last eight games, 73%. So he is still in tune. And it's intercepted and then dropped. And it's going to be called incomplete. Incomplete. What a, what a play by Derek Kinder getting in there and ripping that ball out of the hands. That was Nate Harris who had it. And Nate Harris who couldn't hang on to it. He had it. You're right, he had it, Dave. He's, he's got it. Palco, this is, a, this is the first bad decision in terms of making this throw, I think, that he's made. Right there, it's in the hands. And Nate Harris has it until Kinder reaches in there with those strong hands he has and rips it out. Looks like a pretty solid call by the officials also. Harris, another player from South Florida in this game. Unbelievable. Both these school, two, two schools had so many Floridians on their rosters. That's a dangerous throw right there, and it's intercepted by Louisville. That's Gavin Smart down the sideline. And he is finally squashed by Jeff Ota. But Gavin Smart with a pick for Louisville and a 21-yard return. Boy, that was a dangerous throw. Palco tried to fit it in between a corner and a safety and a cover two look. And if you don't put a lot of zip on that ball, here you see, here's the safety. He's going to go back. He's got deep half. This corner is going to sit back here, and he's going to have the flats. And what that receiver up top is going to do is try and get between the two of them. Right there he is between. And now you got to throw that ball a little sooner. But I really think you hold on to that one because the safety did a nice job coming over there and making the hit. John Russell. Well, here is a significant test for Pitt's defense. Louisville has ripped through them in the second quarter. Screen it out to Stripling. And he is set up and knocked over that time. Good hit by Rashad Duncan. Well, coming up at halftime, we'll check in with our buddy Reese Davis for the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report. The Florida Gators, yes, they won in Tallahassee, but it wasn't very easy. And a score that made this crowd happy, the Mountaineers losing. And, then of course, a look at tonight's game, the collision in the Coliseum, the Irish and the Trojans on ABC. Louisville trying to win the Big East Championship. They will need help, however, from West Virginia. Brown, plenty of time. He goes to his under. Oh, what a hit! They call that a fumble. They do. It's pit ball. Mustakis comes away with it, and HB Blades with a huge hit. Well, they love to run that underneath crossing route, and if you're an inside linebacker and you expel, expand the field of your vision, you'll see it coming, which you saw Blades did, and then he just puts the helmet right on the football, pops it loose, and then Mustakis, kind of Johnny on the spot, running to the football, came up with one. That was Barnage who took the punishment. Look at this. That's a middle linebacker's dream right there. A receiver coming late underneath over the middle, and you see it coming. Get yourself in position and deliver the blow. I've never seen you happier. <laughs> I kind of enjoyed that one. <laughs> we have a timeout on the field that will return as Dave Wanstead's Pitt Panthers got the ball back on the turnover. Back in Pittsburgh, that last fumble recovery by Gus Mistakis is, is under review. The question is whether or not Barnage had control of the football after H.B. Blades hit him. Be the judge yourself. One, two steps, and he gets hit right after he's trying to tuck the ball away. In my book, that's a fumble. I might be partial towards a linebacker making a big <laughs> hit over the middle, but I think Barnage has it. Well, he catches this. One, one step there, second foot comes yeah. down. He's putting it away. To me, that's a catch. And he had complete control of the football also. There wasn't an issue whether he was juggling or not. No, he's trying to stash it under his arm. He's got it right there. He's putting it away, and he gets clobbered. Well, it was funny. We were talking about H.B. Blades. We asked Dave Watts that. What about Blades' pro prospects? And he said, you know, Blades is one of those guys that has that strike against him. Oh, he's not tall enough. He's not big enough. He's not fast enough. The guy's just a player. 
Yeah, and I think he'll have a nice career in the NFL. And, and as Dave Wanstead said, he's going to be one of those guys that every year they're going to try and replace him with someone stronger, younger, you know, faster, and all those things. And he'll sweat it out on cut day. But, you know, before you know it, he could have a 10 year career. And I was in those shoes. <laughs> I know how that is. Well, the comparison that uh, Dave Wanstead made it was to Zach Thomas, my right. Miami Dolphins fine linebacker, who's pretty secure now. But uh, certainly in the beginning of his career, they said the same things about him. Vince? Uh, pumping life into a sideline. There were a lot of Pittsburgh players hanging their head after that interception. And when Blades made that hit, this whole sideline erupted. And it wasn't a play that just the defensive players appreciated. As Blades came off the field, even the offensive guys came over and gave him a pat on the shoulders for that big hit. By the way, HB stands for Horatio Benedict. And and that is his dad's name, Benny Blades. And, well, with a name like Horatio Benedict, maybe we understand now why Benny went by Benny, right? It also stands for a hit barnage, which is exactly what <laughs> yeah. he did on that play. <laughs> this official review, Ray, has taken a long time. Let's take a look at this as it happened. Yeah, in real speed. We won't slow it down this time. And that's, let's see what you think after that. I tell you, the other thing you got to hear was the sound of that collision on that replay. That was a lot of plastic. I wonder if they're just trying to figure out the spot of the football here. Maybe that is the problem, but that is not that difficult. They've got it set down at the 38-yard line, where of all people, Brian Brom made the tackle. And here we go. At the review, there's indisputable video evidence that it was not a catch. It's an incomplete pass. Third down. 127 on the clock. the clock. And that probably was the argument that what, what do they reset the clock at? Wow. Well, there was a brief moment where the ball was in the crook of his left arm and began to leak out, and I guess that's what they looked at. Well, if, if that's indisputable evidence, I'm going to be here to dispute it. So that's no longer indisputable. But I, I'm Luckily, telling you, I think he has the football. I do, too. That's a poor call. I hate to pick on the replay official, but I agree with you. And now it's up to the Pittsburgh team you know, who got the lift off of that to continue with that momentum and try to get a stop, at least force a field goal here by Louisville. And they got so, a third and long, which is they're in a good shape to do that. The Brom has had so much time. Pitt has not been able to generate any real pressure. And this has this crowd now in an angry mood at Hines Field. And they're pressing across the board. Here they come. Down the middle, Arutia again. Oh, they held him. Yeah, that's an easy pass interference call that time. Even I could see that. Revis on the coverage. Yeah, and Revis let Arutia get the inside leverage on him. And once you let a big man like that get that position on you, you, you really have very few options at that point. You see him, he's going to be outside. He's favoring outside. Pass he doesn't have a. On the defense, number 25, 15-yard penalty. From the previous line scrimmage, automatic first down. Uh, to me, that's curious coverage. Revis, an obvious outside technique, but there was no safety in the middle of the field. If you're going to play man to man with nobody free deep, you have to play inside technique, or you'll give that up all day long. What a turnaround. We thought this ball was going to belong to Pitt at the 38 yard line. Now, here's Colby Smith. The flag comes in behind the play, however, thrown by the referee. So this run may be wiped out. Kennard Cox on the tackle. Holding on the offense, number 78. 10 yard penalty from the previous line of scrimmage. Replay first down. And that's. Gia Camini is the, the, the tackle that gets this thing. You're going to see right over here. Well, they switched it, but right here's the holding. That's 79 of Foster. Yeah, they gave the wrong number, but the right tackle, Foster, is the one guilty, and he did hold on that play. 6'7, 327, Bernardo Foster from Ripley, Tennessee. Now, first and 20. Smith, the tailback, stays in the block. Wow, look at the timing. It passes tipped. What a lineman did that old thing, Ray. At least if you can't get there, try to disrupt the passing lane. Right, and I'm watching film on Brom. That's the one thing he does get a number of balls tipped every game. 
And he's just got to be able to find better windows to throw the football through. But you're right about the time he had. He had all day to do this thing. It's Duncan on the tip. He's from Florida. <laughs> Bell blade. Well, I have not heard this crowd so far in the first half this into the game as they are right now trying to help their Panthers defense. They just can't get to Brown. And he can find his guy right at the marker. That's Douglas. And that may be a first down. That's about a 20 yard play. And Pitt continues to rush with just four. Just that defensive line, which, you know, is a little bit undermanned. They've lost a couple of starters due to injuries. Chris McKillop out, Doug Fulmer out, both out for the season. They lost another guy, Mick Williams, who had been in there and made some downs, made some plays for him. So they've got younger guys in there. Not their first line all the way across, and they're not able to get the pressure with just four. Louisville is 49 out of 52 in the red zone this year. Here's HB sitting right up here, going to get some. Willie, no. Instead, it'll be a touchdown with Anthony Allen. Tell you what, you go back to that review, and there's a flag down. Hold on, Louisville had one touchdown wiped out with a flag. Will it be a second one? And more importantly, a third and one. Holding, Holding. On, the on the offense, number 89. 10-yard penalty from the spot of the infraction. Replay third down. Second time the Cardinals have had a touchdown taken away because of a penalty. The last time it happened, they had to settle for a field goal. And Louisville is called for a timeout with 45 seconds remaining. Well, let's find out what's going to be going on in your living rooms at halftime with Reese Davis. All right, guys, coming up on the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report, Florida gets by in a squeaker again. We'll examine what that does to the Gators' hopes of being that one-loss team in the title game. We know this much. They're better off than West Virginia, who got knocked around at home against South Florida. We'll show you what went wrong for the Mountaineers and what it means for the other Big East hopefuls to get into the Big BCS mix and also look ahead to USC and Notre Dame coming up tonight in the Coliseum. It's all coming up. Mark May and Lou Holtz will join me in just a few seconds. All right, Reese, thank you very much. Got a lot to talk about in this half as well as the officials have begun to become a factor in the last couple of minutes. A controversial overturn of a fumble by the replay official and then a couple of calls that have hurt Louisville. Then they've lost two touchdowns so far in this half on penalties. And that last one, it was third down and one. You, th you tack on the penalty. Now it's third and 11, and Pitt has a, a great opportunity here to force a field goal. Now, I think they need to bring pressure, though. They, they've tried rushing with just four and, and covering with seven. They haven't been able to do it. They need to blitz on this down, in my opinion. Third down at about 11. They get to the five. You see between the five and the six-yard lines, we'll get to the first down. Here they come. They did it, but it's picked up. Brown running out of time and just threw it away. Good coverage in the secondary. No one with any separation. Brown moving around the pocket a little bit to avoid some of those rushers. Nobody to throw the ball to has to dump it out of bounds. And Bobby Petrino having a beef with an official. Looking for his 39th win at Louisville. This will be a 32-yard kick for maybe the hottest kicker in the country. Carmody made 16 straight. Blade. It, it is blocked by Blades. Who else for Pitt? He wanted to have a big day as a senior, and he's done it. Well, you couldn't even see Ray. He got in there so fast you couldn't even see the holder. It was unbelievable. He, he uh, nobody touched him. Right up the middle, nobody touched him. That's a, a grievous error by that field goal team. And Blades just comes from depth. Here he is. He's going to come from depth. And you're going to see him actually he's going to run up inside there. And the left guard blocks outside. The center blocks down on the nose. And they leave a huge gap for Blades to run through untouched. He almost took it off the tee. I was going to say, you normally, look at the angle. You normally never see a kick blocked that quickly. So now Pitt. 
clock running on them already, so they've only got about 20 seconds. Not sure if they're going to be able to do a whole lot here. Bobby Petrino still upset over those two holding calls that cost him a touchdown. Yep. Oh, intercept and dropped. That would have been yet another wild turnaround, but Rod Council couldn't hang on. Boy, it hit him right between the one and the four, too. Another mistake by Tyler Palco. He got away with that one. Have we had enough action for everybody in the last couple of minutes? <laughs> everybody satisfied? I'll tell you what, Big East football has taken some lumps over the years, but I think they've come back great this year, and they've got some of the top teams in the country. And it's reflected in the standings, although uh, West Virginia took one on the chin today, as Reese told you, and he'll tell you all about that at halftime. And yeah, they'll play it safe here. This run Collins and undoubtedly run out the clock. This has been a crazy first half, especially the last couple of minutes. Louisville will go into the dressing room with the seven point advantage. Our halftime score has Louisville in front 24 to 17. Now let's join Reese Davis. Time for the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report. Entertaining, hard-hitting first half, Louisville with BCS aspirations up by a touchdown on Pittsburgh. Lou Holtz and Mark May are here, and Louisville still needs a little bit of help. They need Rutgers to fall. They need West Virginia to help them, and the Mountaineers didn't help themselves against South Florida. ESPN College Football presented by Cars.com. You see our score. We're about to start the third quarter, and Ray, that was a fiery finish to an explosive first half. Both of these teams, Louisville, left a lot of points on the table. Yeah, 11 points that they left on the table due to those penalties, and Bobby Petrino not happy with that. Not happy with his field goal team either as HP Blades came and blocked that kick. That was huge. Pitt's going to get the ball first with a chance to tie this thing up here early in the third. They didn't protect Tyler Palco nearly as well in the second quarter as in the first. What do they have to do? Well, I think they have to go back to that short passing game that they were working out early on with the one step drop the three step get it out quick negate that rush and, and try to make plays after the catch and the Panthers in their gold senior day Tyler Palco's last opportunity to play in front of the home folks and Pitt trying to get to a bowl game if they win this they'll get seven and they'll be in but at six and six well you don't know if they'll be in a bowl game because Dave said joke with us we've been bowl eligible for about six months yeah and they started out their season six and one So here's Robinson. And I tell you one thing, Louisville's done a very good job with their kick coverage, but they are not completely happy. And Bobby Petrino spoke with our Vince Welch earlier, and the coach said what made him angry about the first half. We needed to get some points out of the break. We got a couple touchdowns called back. Uh, I'd like to see the penalties. I'd like to see them on video. And then uh, we got the field goal blocked at the end. Our defense has got to play in the second half. Offensively, we're moving the ball. We just got to get in the end zone. Thanks, Coach. And the intensity of Bobby Petrino right there. We had some flags after the play. Dead ball. Dead ball. Personal, foul. Personal foul. Pittsburgh. 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 Number one. Number one. Dead ball, ball sort of foul on Louisville, number 46. Penalties offset, first down. That's Terrence Butler for Louisville and Cedric McGee for Pittsburgh hit with those penalties. Well, 11 points, two touchdowns, and we're assuming the extra points will be made because they have an excellent kicker. And, of course, they got a field goal out of one of their canceled touchdowns, but the other canceled touchdown led to a blocked field goal. So here is Tyler Palco, his last half at home in his college career. They fake the reverse, Stevens howling, and he'll maybe get a couple of yards here. Let's get to the first half stats, and they're brought to you by Remington. Ray, anything you see here that really jumps out? Nah, it's a pretty even ball game, you know. It's kind of, you see what's on the scoreboard, and it does reflect in the statistics right now. The turnovers, pretty much even. You know, you throw that blocked field goal in there as a turnover, and then it would be even. So, pretty even ball game. Second down and eight. Steven Towling, the tailback. There's that three-step drop. It was so successful. They throw out to their right and get a first down. So that side in particular, Ray, of that field, they have worked over and over again. Oderick Turner, or excuse me, Oderick Turner on the stop. Good catch. And you're going to see Turner up top here just run a little slant route. And he comes off slow. To kind of creep to to keep that distance because that corner is going to back paddle and if you run fast you're going to run right into him he wanted to create and keep that separation so we could step inside for that slant and then tyler falco accurate with the football gavin smart on the stop 
Collier into the tailback spot now. He carried a couple of times in the first half, not this time. Falco again, here's some room. Into Louisville territory, that's Stevens Howling. His 16th catch of the year results in 29 Panthers yards. Oh, and Stephen Howling is an excellent receiver, not to mention a pretty good running back. He's going to be right here. You're going to see him run up, and there's going to be a huge cushion between him and the man that's assigned to cover him. You see the back pedal, the back pedal, and he breaks underneath it, and there's some uncertainty there by Brandon Sharp as far as covering, and he didn't jump that receiver right away. Boy, you get a guy that open and who's that quick in the field, you're going to get some good run after the catch yards. So we wondered how would the Panthers respond when they open up this third quarter, and we're getting a pretty good answer. Falco under fire, lobs it downfield, and missed his man. They buy him the freshman tight end of the game. I think Falco is just perfectly satisfied with having that ball go out of bounds. We'll take a look at the passing chart from Falco, and you look at all these short routes that he's been throwing out to each side and he's been really good to his right eight for eight over there and the majority of those are those one step just quick quick fires out there get the ball to that receiver take advantage of the cushion and let him make a move and they've, they've made a lot of plays and a lot of yards running that kind of a scheme could be changing the play here does the quarterback really ever do that just for show yeah you'll do it for show you kind of dummy it up once in a while you don't want them to get into exactly what your audibles are. Well, that play was just completely destroyed by Malik Jackson, the junior from Dunwoody, Georgia, down to the sidelines and Vince Welch. Bentley talking, Ray Bentley talking about how uh, Palco is finding the right man and they're turning those plays into some big yardage. Palco and Matt Cavanaugh, the offensive coordinator, spent a lot of time watching tape of Tom Brady and Peyton Manning in the offseason, studying how those two quarterbacks manage the game. And, and Cavanaugh says he's really seen improvement from Palco in that regard of managing the game from all of that studying of Tom Brady and Peyton Manning in the offseason. See if he can manage third down and 10. Louisville walking up a few bodies to the line. They brought one. It was blocked. It's going to be fourth down and ten. So we'll get a look at Adam Gressel, one of the better punters in the nation. The 11th in the country, in fact, in net punting. Pitt able to move the ball a little bit, but stalled out here. But they will have field position after this, you would think. Louisville went to that blitz three times on that drive. They decided to heat it back up. Trent Guy, the wide receiver. Back deep to return this punt around his 10 yard line. Trying to aim this one. This is really high. That's a fine punt. That is really going to work out well for the Pitt Panthers. I do better than that. <laughs> That's unbelievable. There you see the beanbag to mark where that ball is going to wind up. And exactly after the 39 yard kick, how much territory Louisville will have to cover. Well, let's get to our game track presented by John Hancock, and this is the controversial play, Ray. Yeah, and I still dispute the indisputable evidence. I, I think this is a catch. He makes, I think he makes a football move when he puts to, goes to tuck the ball away. That's a football move. But However, yeah, right. They had a happy ending for the Pitt Panthers because of H.B. Blades again. Well, Blades said, all right, you won't give me the forced fumble. I'll just go block a field goal, and we'll finish it that way. And yeah, we'll give you the explanation from the replay booth following this snap. Anthony Allen is the tailback. And he'll get it out to the seven-yard line. Now, we did contact the and Blades, of course, again on the stopper, so it seems he's in on every play. We did contact the replay official, and his explanation was, and Nick Crater is his name, that it was not an issue of control, but it was the fact that he thought that there was not a football move made. And that was the opinion of the replay official as to why that call was overturned. We, in the first half, quickly thought it was the correct call made on the field and disagreed with the replay official. But I need to find out from you, Ray, in a moment what he could have meant by that, by football move. I wish I could tell you. That's Brock Boland. He slipped a little bit and wasn't going to go very far anyway. Joe Claremont has played very well, the junior from Tampa. What do you mean, people at home are going to be wondering, what, what's a football move? A football move, in my estimation, is, is a football move. I mean, it's pretty nebulous as far as what, what it could be. But it's, I think the, the interpretation is to make a football move, he had to have time to get his feet settled, see the defender, and try to put a move on him. 
Now, to me, the football move was he caught the ball and he switched arms with it. To me, and, and he had two feet hit the ground. That's a football move. When you're moving the ball around, he obviously had the football. I, I thought it was a, a legitimate force fumble. Third down and six. Brown trying to work out of his end zone, and he gets them the first down. The receiving core for Louisville, Douglas, who made the catch there, and Arutia having big days. 14 yards and a first down for the Cardinals. Yeah, and Pitt is still yet to get after the quarterback. Brown, they have not hit him all day long. And if you're going to not get that kind of pressure on Brian Brown, he will pick you apart, and that's what he's been doing. Looks like Duncan may have gotten a piece of this pass. And he did actually. He got two big claws on that and uh, was not able to knock it to the ground. Yeah, so look how he's rushing, Dave. He's, he's not even trying to put pressure. He's trying to get into a throwing lane and get his hands up. They almost hit Brown from the backside. That's one of his few poor throws of the evening. Uh, it brings up second down and 10. Brian Bennett providing the pressure there from the linebacker spot. The senior getting the start today. And you see Pitt now trying to get uh, makes a blitz or two in there to get a little pressure on Brown. They realize. You know, it's kind of how do you want to die? You know, you can you can <laughs> blitz and let him carve you up because you can't cover one on one. You don't match the speed up very well across the board, or you you don't blitz and you try to play zone and you give Brown time to find the guy. It's a tough way to deal with things. And Brown doing the walk up to the line changes the play from the shotgun to under center. And they check off to the run and seemed like a pretty good idea. As Colby Smith dragging. Rashad Duncan all the way to the first down marker. It looks like he may have been given the first down. Yeah, they ran this play right into a blitz from the outside, and it was two ships in the night. Smith blew right past it. Well, one thing we've noticed, and it's been flawless so far, Brian Brom had a thumb injury. In fact, he had thumb surgery in September on the 17th, and he's actually changed the way he takes the center snap to protect that thumb, although the thumb is fine, but I guess it's just like changing your putting grip. Once you get used to it, you stick with it if it works. Yeah, hopefully we'll get a look at that and be able to show you exactly what we're talking about in terms of his hand position. Barnage got some room to work here. And fought off kind of a not a complete tackle that time as the defender Clint Session went for the hit and not the wrap and it cost him a few yards 15 yard pickup that time for Gary Barnett who averages this is outstanding for a tight end about 18 yards per catch. You now we talked about Brian Brown and, and his thumb injury and it's amazing to me how quickly he came back from that you know missing just two ball games that's a lot of healing to me is your, your mind how quickly do you want to be back and obviously he wanted to get back in a hurry it's like Pitt brought some pressure that time on the go to the fullback and Brock Bolin 25 20 he uses the stiff arm and all the way down inside the 15 yard line no flags on that play they're going to be down to the 13 yard line the sophomore from Germantown, Ohio, who did not play last year because of injuries, burns the pit defense. Uh, he catches him in a blitz, and, there, and then there's no linebacker to fold over the top to make that play. So if once you get through that first line of defenders, now you're off and running into the open field. And the big guy bowling shows you he's got some moves, and he does carry the ball pretty good. 6.5 yards per carry. I was going to say, though, it's got to drive you crazy. If you're pit, you're always worried about Smith and Aruti and Douglas, and the fullback kills you. Well, this time they get him back. He loses yards on that. All right, Ray, take us through what we're talking about here with the hands and Brom. Well, there's Brom, and it's that thumb. It's his right thumb, his top thumb. And so you're going to see how he, he kind of overlaps the thumbs, which is kind of different. Most quarterbacks will take their thumbs, and they'll put them together like this. He's overlapping them so that when he takes that ball, there's no pressure on that, that hurt thumb, that top, that right thumb, that throwing finger throwing hand thumb and so he's gone to a different way to receive the snap in order to protect himself loss of two on that brings up second and 12 and Louisville so deadly in the red zone they go to Arutia he's got a chance to score and he will get the first down it looks like but that will be all but that's enough actually that's a 13 yard pickup well he's a tough guy to cover and when he runs a crossing route you just don't have people with the speed to keep up with him you see him get beat he beats Brady again running across the field and it, you know, they just don't have the speed to match up with him on those underneath crossing routes. The only time they really got him, and that was actually a different receiver, H.P. Blades sits in the middle and headhunts. And that's what you have to do. You have to have somebody on that backside looking out for it. Tenth play of the drive for the Cardinals. And that's Allen, and he won't get it. 
Well, Willie. Uh, they're going to they're gonna call it. Yeah, they blew the whistle. I, I Great effort, though, huh? He didn't quit. <laughs> I'm sure his coaches will be pleased with him on that, but that's going to get it down to about the one. Anthony Allen, who had a touchdown called back earlier. Sam Bryant making the stop, and also Kennard Cox in that wrestling match down there. It'll make it second and goal. And Anthony Allen has got a nose for the end zone. You know, he's got 10 touchdowns, and they love him down in this area because of the kind of effort that he gives, like we saw in that last play. This drive is going to go about 98 yards if they can get it in the end zone, and they do. Touchdown, Louisville. What an impressive way to start your offense out as Barnage gets his second touchdown of the season. And by the way, no flags. This is just a bootleg, and you lose track of the tight end because everybody's so geared up to stop the run. Now, there's the tight end on the backside. You're also going to get the fullback running through to the flat. That tight end's going to come over here, and he's going to end up wide open on the backside. See Barnage get through there? Nobody from the front side's looking for him. Nobody's got him man to man. Great play call by Bobby Petrino down there. His brother may be the offensive coordinator, Paul Petrino, but Bobby calls all the plays, and he dialed up a touchdown for his eighth-ranked Louisville Cardinals. 31-17 to 17 now. Can the Pitt Panthers do something? And Brian Brom has thrown his 10th touchdown pass of the season. This telecast is available on ESPN HD, presented by Pioneer Plasma. Hope you're enjoying a fun football game so far in the Big East. Louisville 31 and Pittsburgh 17. We're at Heinz Field in downtown Pittsburgh. Yes, all those yellow seats mean you are at the home of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And one of six fields shared by Division 1A schools and NFL schools. A couple of them indoors. Also, the Saints and the Vikings. The Bucks have that beautiful Raymond James Stadium. The Chargers in San Diego State. And the new Lincoln Financial Field for the Owls and the Eagles. And I would say that Pittsburgh has as close a relationship with their NFL parent team, if you will, than any of the others. They, they have the same practice facility. They share the buildings there. They sh obviously share the stadium. But there's a nice synergy between the two. Very short kickoff, and that will bring Robinson up to nearly the 10-yard line. But Louisville has really bottled him up. 30-yard average, and he just didn't get very far at all. Only 17 yards on the return. Well, we always talk about what kind of adjustments do coaches make at halftime and all that. Look at Louisville in the third quarter, what they have done this season. Yeah, that's just an amazing uh, number there. 98 points to 22 for your opponent. And what that tells you is that your coaching staff's pretty good. They'll go in there and make some really nice adjustments at halftime, and then your players pick up on it as well. You got a corner blitz coming. Oh, and this is intercepted by Gay. And all of a sudden, the bottom is beginning to fall out of the Panthers' chances of winning this football game. Their defense has been put into a bad hole. Well, Palco saw what I saw, the corner, William Gay sneaking up. So he's thinking, okay, I got that corner blitz. There he is right there, but he backed out instead. And Palco didn't recognize it, and he threw it right to William Gay. That's a nice bluff by Gay on the corner blitz, and then backs out right into the throwing lane. That's a heck of a play. It's a good call up top, too, by the defensive coordinator, Mike Cassidy. That is Gay's team-leading fifth interception. That gives the Cardinals killer field position at the 24-yard line. Stripling the back goes in motion. Why not go to Rutia? You have all day with great success. And he has wrestled out of bounds by Kennard Cox. Brian Brown is just an impressive quarterback. He just makes every throw. The accuracy, I think, is the thing that differentiates him from others. He puts the ball right where it needs to be most of the time, and especially when he has time to throw. And he has had time all day. Yeah, he's, he's had a couple of balls tipped, but other than that, he hasn't been hit, has not been sacked. Got a clean jersey down there. Now bowling. In from the fullback spot. He had a big run earlier. This time they were waiting for him. No gain, and he did not get the first down. Well, Eric Wood, we've talked about him, the ability at center, a sophomore from Cincinnati, and Vince said uh, this is an interesting story. This guy has a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. Yeah, Dave, all the line calls in the Cardinals running game are made by Eric Wood. He made his 23rd consecutive start here today, but what makes that number amazing is that he's just a sophomore. Wood was a freshman when he stepped into the starting lineup last year. Pretty rare in college football to have a freshman as your starting center. 
Brown with a good play action fake dumped off the pass to tight end coming out and it will be a first down session on the stop on Scott Kuhn that is Kuhn's seventh catch of the season and it will move the chains for the Cardinals. You know, we're talking about Eric Wood. Last year, he was surrounded by veterans when he was just a freshman. Now, as a sophomore, believe it or not, he is the veteran, but the coaches were telling us he's smart, he's talented, experienced, and he's going to be around a while now, just a sophomore, and that's certainly good news for this Louisville offense. He is. That was a good job. He talked about Brian Brom having his jersey clean tonight, and that's one of the reasons why is 77 Eric Wood. In the red zone again, Louisville about 96 percent. They begin another touchdown. They do. That is Spillman. Juwan Spillman, the freshman from Louisville, gets his first touchdown of the season on a 13-yard carry, and now the Cardinals have busted this one open. Boy, oh, that's just the speed of Spillman winning the race around the edge. They had good blocking over there on that edge, but he hit the gas pedal, and there was nobody from Pitt who could catch it. Art Carmody beyond attack on the PAT. Louisville in the red zone this year has only missed three times. And they are perfect today. 38 to 17. And now the real challenge on Tyler Palco is to find a way to get the Panthers back in this game. Take a look at this touchdown. You're going to see here's Spillman. He's just going to come around and outrace everybody. Kind of a jet sweep type thing. He's got a little lead from the fullback out that way, stripling, and that's uh, that's just speed getting to the edge. It's college football brought to you by Dodge. You can take life as it comes, or you can grab life by the horns. Dodge and Remington Titanium Shavers. It is the holiday season around Pittsburgh. We welcome you to Heinz Field in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where the Panthers taking on eighth-ranked Louisville. I'm Dave Lamond, along with Ray Bentley and Vince Welch. And the numbers on the quarterback, Brian Brom, nearly flawless today. Tyler Falco's got to play catch-up now. Can his Panthers find a way? Well, if you're going to play catch-up, you might as well play it at Heinz Field. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm apologetic. I think our audience could be happy that I'm speechless, but uh, <laughs> wow. Ray Bentley, everyone, just make note of that. Ray Bentley. <laughs> Robinson on the kickoff. They have bottled him up pretty well, but he might make a move here and get outside. And he gets it out to the 29-yard line. Some hard-earned yards that time on the kick return of 27 yards. Flannery on the stop. Well, here we go. Pete Carroll as USC competing for another spot in the BCS championship game. And the night they face a tough task as Charlie Weiss is fighting Irish. Head to the Coliseum. Saturday night football presented by Southwest Airlines. Part of Rivalry Week presented by Remington on ABC. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. There's a little history there. SC's won the last four. And, of course, the twisty Matt Leinert run. Pete Carroll can't beat him in November. And, of course, Brady Quinn, the outstanding Irish quarterback as... Stephen Talley kind of hiding in that pile a little bit there. Ray, what do you like about this game tonight, and who do you like? Boy, this is a tough one for me to call. You know, you think USC, after that stumble early, they've really gotten it together and playing well, but Notre Dame's been playing well, but they haven't been playing a lot of stiff competition, so it'd be interesting to see how they come out. I guess I would have to say USC because they're at home if I had to pick. Second down and five. Somebody accused Notre Dame of playing stiffs in competition lately, but not stiff competition. I wouldn't go that far. Stephen Fowling just shy of the first down. It looked like Gay wrapped him up right about at the marker, and they're going to call him definitely short by almost a full yard. You know, I like the confidence that Matt Cavanaugh has in his offense, though. You know, all of a sudden you're down by this many. Four minutes or so left in the third quarter, and he's not trying to air it out. You know, you run the ball up the middle a couple of times, stick to the plan, keep going. You don't have to panic yet at this point, even though you're down 21. Stevens Howling again, the top of the eye. By the tight end in motion. And that's a first down. And more. Stevens Howling continuing to pump the legs even after being hit. I'm telling you, he's little, but he plays big. And uh, you know, the other thing about a small back, a five foot seven back, is that he's sometimes hard to see. And so you're not going to get the good, clean shot at him 
coming up as a linebacker or a secondary guy because you don't see him soon enough. So a lot of times it gives that back an advantage in terms of breaking those tackles. You see the numbers on Steven Towling. He had three touchdowns in a game this year versus Central Florida and ran for 221 against Syracuse. It's a dart of a pass broken up by Gay. Let's go to the studios and join Reese Davis. All right, guys, every week we honor the singular All-America Player of the Week, and you can certainly make your voice heard. All you have to do, text vote to 87654 on your singular wireless phone to access the nominees for the singular All-America Player of the Week, and when you do that, you can enter to win a chance to win a trip to the national championship game. All right, Reese, thank you much. Hope a lot of you jump on that opportunity. Fake corner blitz again, or is he going to come? He does. And they block it very well. Falco, though, is going to have to take it down. And he picked up seven on the play. Preston Smith went for the high tackle. Brings up a pretty big third down now. Pittsburgh's offense is going to have to be flawless the rest of the way. Lovo has now blitzed 13 times this afternoon, which is really, I think, fewer than what they normally will do. And when you get a, a team that's coming out and throwing the ball so quick like Pitt started this game, it takes you out of your blitz. You know, there's no sense in blitzing if the quarterback's getting rid of the ball on a one or three step drop. Pitt going with two tight ends here. They use Collins actually as a tight end, the fullback. He's the open receiver and Falco tried to thread that through and just couldn't get it done. Gay again in on the coverage, may have gotten a hand on that pass. So now, you got to go for it. Yeah, I was going to say fourth and three. Dave wants that. He's been not at all shy about using fourth down as an opportunity. In fact, Gay almost took that thing all the way in. Yeah, that was a bad decision by Palco right there. There were three defenders between him and the, re the intended receiver, and he just tried to jam that thing in there. But I like this decision here, and I, I think what you want to do is get Palco out on the edge and give him a run pass option. But if you're Louisville, if you make the stop, you have to think that you're going to maybe win the game right here, potentially, if you make this stop. And they do. Oh, no. yep, yep, yep. Thought he may have reached over William Gay. He's been involved in quite a few plays in this half, and he'll be called for the interference. Yeah, he got that left arm wrapped around the intended receiver before the ball got there. And then Bobby Petrino isn't complaining. Pass interference. Pass interference. On, the On the defense. Number 21. Ball be placed at the spot of the infraction. Automatic. Automatic. First down. Well, maybe he is complaining. <laughs> at, at first, I thought that he had accepted that call, but let's see if he has any reason to complain. No, he doesn't. You're going to see it right there. He's got his left arm wrapped around Kinder way before the ball got there, and you saw him point him to himself. He knew he had that one. So the Panthers now three for three on fourth down conversions. That would be a penalty. Under pressure. Well, nice job to avoid the potential sack. Still going. Terrence Butler had a clean opportunity back at the 50-yard line. Would have been an enormous loss, but uh, Tyler Palco reverting back to the form of a couple of years ago is able to at least sneak away for two yards and keep this drive going. Now they had the perfect defense called on this one as Butler's. He's got the bootleg. He's playing it all the way, but Palco shows you a little bit of shiftiness, the ability to make people miss back there and then run it afterwards. And I really like Palco. I think he's going to be a good player at the next level. You see the numbers. The touchdown pass for Pitt today was thrown by the wide receiver Kinder. And his numbers have shrunk a little bit. Under pressure, stepped up nicely done that time. And there is Kinder, shy of the first down. Brings up third down and two. And again, Louisville just coming with that corner blitz. And this time they don't fool Palco. They got him on an interception earlier. You're going to see the corner blitz here. The receiver's going to see it and come in right behind it. And that's what you want to call that throwing hot. You throw it right in behind Gay, who the corner where he came from, and the guy who has to make that coverage is going to be the safety over the top. So anything underneath, you're going to have a fairly easy pitch and catch, which is what they did. And notice also Falco took that step up and got away from the pressure, too, and that gave him that extra beat he needed to complete the pass. Here comes everybody. And they really hammered him that time. 
Yeah, Louisville trying to say that it was a fumble, but the officials are calling it an incomplete pass. Brings up another fourth down that the Panthers are probably going to have to go for as John Russell was right in Palco's shin strap. Boy, and they missed an opportunity there because the tight end Steve Bucus was open. He had a step down the middle, and if Russell doesn't get there, it might have given Palco time to see that and make that long throw because he was definitely open with Bucus. So here we go. They're three out of three on fourth downs and the clock is stopped by one of the officials. I don't believe a timeout was called. I think they're re-spotting the football. Because that gives the quarterback a few extra seconds to run over there. Paco was coordinating. And Paco in this half, three out of 10 for 45 and an interception. So again, to use the poker expression, the Panthers go all in. The big bootleg down. You got a couple tight ends up top. Here comes a heavy blitz. And it's knocked away. Coverage by Abe Brown that time as they try to go to Nate Byam. And the Panthers cannot convert on their fourth attempted fourth down. Louisville in control at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh. Tonight on ESPN at 745 Eastern, Wake Forest continues fighting for the ACC Atlantic Division title. They visit Maryland. College football primetime as part of Rivalry Week presented by Remington on ESPN Saturday at 745 Eastern. Also available in high definition on ESPN HD. And for more information, just log on to ESPN.com. There you see our situation here at Heinz Field, Louisville now. With the ball again after forcing for the first time today, Pittsburgh to not convert on fourth down. Bobby Petrino, the play caller. And Louisville has only punted once, and that was back at the beginning of the game when they could not move the football. They have not punted since then. Right, first possession of the ball game, they, they went three and out. But since then, it's it's been kind of running up and down the field. And speaking of the field, it, it hasn't really affected the play very much. And they'll continue to put it up. And again, he has all day. And that's going to be a first down and more. Brady on the stop as they go to Durante Taylor, the senior from Montgomery, Alabama. Durante Taylor making a 21-yard play out of that. Now, Ray referred to the field. If you're just joining us, there were four high school football games played on Friday here at Heinz Field. And there was some talk that the field was just going to be as we have a Panthers player shaken up. And that effect is Jameel Brady. That you see the middle of the field is brown. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. And there was some concern that this was going to lead to maybe some injuries or at least slow Louisville down, but that has not happened. Now the, the footing has been pretty good, and, and I think the reason they rolled this thing, and so it's it's a hard surface, and there's just a little enough dirt on top, loose dirt that you can get good footing from your cleats. Yeah, there was uh, some substances placed on the field to try to make it look just a little bit better as we try to find out what happened to Brady. Well, that's what happened to him. He got hit by a got run over. 39 pound runaway freight train. Brady giving up about 35 pounds on that exchange. Big game for Louisville. They do not control their destiny in the Big East. Now, West Virginia really took a crippling loss today to South Florida. But Louisville's got to win out, and they play Connecticut next week. And Connecticut, ask Pitt about them. They could spoil your day. And then Louisville needs some help from West Virginia to beat Rutgers. They go to Allen. Another huge hit. There's a helmet popper that time. He's coming away without his hat. Clint Session. So the Panthers still hitting fiercely when they get the opportunity. Yeah, but they're going to have to make it work for them in terms of knocking a ball loose. You know, they got to come up with some kind of play if they have any hopes of, of coming back in this ball game. It rests on the defense making stops or forcing turnovers. Second and long. Then they'll go to Colby Smith this time and all over him. As the pit defense, Mike Phillips made the first hit, and H.B. Blades came over to help polish him off. But that will be the end of the first quarter as Louisville is in command here. 38-17, three quarters in the books here at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh. We'll find out.
the Cardinals can put this game away and get Bobby Petrino a 10th win on the year. You're watching college football on ESPN. Bobby Petrino's team averages 37.6 points per game. They've hit their number as you see the score by quarters. Pittsburgh competitive in the first half. This is kind of reminding me of the way Pittsburgh played against West Virginia, Ray. Great, competitive, exciting first half. Second half, their offense went away and West Virginia pulled away. Now it's happening here. Right, and they have the trouble with contending with a lot of speed on the perimeter over four quarters. Third down and four here, stripling the back. Little shovel pass. And that's Spillman, and he has the first down. Shovel pass goes to 26, Juwan Spillman. So Juwan Spillman, who's made one big touchdown already with a big play there, because that means Pitt is going to have to suffer through some more plays unless they can force a turnover. Kenzie Matthews, a stop for the Kenzie Matthews in on the stop. Play Brian Brown today has passed Stefan LaFours for number four all time in Louisville pass yards. And that's Stripling. Nobody's touched him yet. They finally shove him out of bounds after almost getting the first down. Well, Bedlam 101 continues. Reese Davis has the latest, Reese. And boy, it came right down to the end. Oklahoma 27 21 on Oklahoma State. Zach Robinson in the quarterback firing for Dewan Woods, and he can't quite catch it. Oklahoma goes to the Big 12 championship game 27 21 the final. They went to Oklahoma State. That's a fine season for uh, Mike Gundy's squad there to go down to the very end. Yeah, I think the future is very bright there for the Cowboys. Second and short. And this play will never happen. Find out, did Pitt jump or were they induced? They definitely jumped. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. Do they have help? <laughs> well, the question is, were they induced? Dead ball. Dead ball. Offsides. Offsides. On the defense. On the defense. There, was contact, there was contact. Number 93. Number 93. Five-yard penalty, Five penalty will result in the first down. And this is a nice job again by the center, Eric Wood. You see him number 77 right there. He's going to see him in that neutral zone. And then you snap it immediately. Quarterback takes a knee and you count your five yards. And that gives a first down to the Cardinals. Mistake us with a mistake out of Cooper City. That's a South Florida town near Fort Lauderdale. Again, Brom, and this time he's got a rule. Well, they'll hit him here. No, they won't, actually. He still managed to avoid being hit. Gets nine on that scramble. Bennett forced him down. Dave, you probably notice you see the hand holding that goes on here by this offensive line by Louisville. And this is a great way to help out your offensive tackles. Because usually you got to look in. You see that where the eyes are looking. The tackle does not have to look in at the ball. He knows when to go. He can keep his eyes outside and keep him on rushers. He knows when to go as the guard looks in at the ball. And when he moves that hand, then the tackle knows as well. He doesn't have to cheat his eyesight inside. He can look up at the rushers. Plenty of time again for Brahm as he buys time and throws the dart flag down. And it's a touchdown for Scott Kuhn. But Louisville's had two touchdowns wiped out by penalties already. So I'm sure on that sideline, they're not going to celebrate just yet. Yeah, they've seen it. They've seen it a couple of times already. They're going to make sure. Pass interference, Pass interference. on the offense. There you go. Number seven. Number seven. 15-yard penalty, 15 penalty from the previous line of scrimmage. Replay second down. Replay well, they finally down. found something that Mario Richard didn't do well. That penalty is on him, but that is another touchdown wiped out. Well, here's Yeruti on the outside. He's going to run an inside route and try and screen the defender right there. And the thing that got him was the push off at the end. That wasn't a pick like you normally see, but it was a push off. And I don't know. That's a tough one to call to me. It really didn't affect the play. He wasn't the intended receiver. You seldom see that in that situation. That would be 18 points lost to penalties today by Louisville. Third touchdown called back because of a penalty against them. And nothing happens on that play there. Bolin 
wrapped up very, very quickly by Mackenzie Matthews, among others. But they've had uh, poor luck with the uh, the officials today. Rashad Duncan also in there. So think of where we would be if not for that. Brings up third down, and they've got about 16 to go. Matthews only a freshman. 18 seniors in their last game for the Pitt Panthers today here at Heinz Field. Just gunned it in there, but knocked away. Good coverage that time on Arudium. Kennard Cox was in it on that group. Adam Gunn also. Yeah, big square in route by Yerudia, and he got to the chains. Had he caught it, it would have been a first down. A good defense there by Cox. And you would think that Art Carmody would be the man to call on here, and here he comes. His streak of consecutive field goals was snapped when one was blocked today. He had 16 in a row at one point. The block was unbelievable because of the way that H.B. Blades was able to roll right into the middle. I'm going to assume that they're going to make an adjustment on that as he goes for 43 yards, 42 yards out. There's Blades right there. And they blocked him this time, and the field goal is good. So it's going to be that much harder for the Pitt Panthers to come back at home as they trail by 24 at Heinz Field on ESPN College Football. Back in Pittsburgh, here today's game track is presented by John Hancock, Rick. Yeah, Gary Barnage, the tight end, had a career week last week with five catches, 112 yards. Follows it up with this TD reception from Brian Brom. And then Joan Spillman on the jet sweep just outraces everybody to the edge and gets it inside the pylon. Those are your two touchdowns for the Louisville Cardinals in the third quarter. Yeah, Brom with touchdown passes 9, 10, and 11 on the season. No interceptions. Hasn't even been hit. That's an amazing thing to me. And when you, and you get your quarterback, you've gone three and a quarters and change, and he hasn't been hit yet, your offensive line's playing pretty well. Robinson and Porter back deep for the Panthers. Here's where they really need Robinson. Very dangerous kick returner to bust one here, at least give the Panthers some good field position. Hasn't happened yet today. They've done a good job covering these kicks. It'll be Porter a couple of yards deep. Got a hole here, though. He can get around the corner. He got a block. It's Porter. And it's the kicker who helped put him down. Stop made there by Travis Norton, but also a great job that time by Todd Flannery to keep that thing from going all the way. That's a 57-yard return. Well, Pete Carroll has him ready. USC competing for another shot of the national championship. Tonight, however, it's a tough task. Charlie Weiss is fighting Irish, going to L.A. in the Coliseum. It's Saturday Night Football presented by Southwest Airlines, part of Rivalry Week. That's presented by Remington on ABC. And also, you can log on to ESPN.com for more information. Stevens Howling stands aside the quarterback. And Falco now got to air it out, you'd say. Blitz is picked up nicely. Stevens Howling. It's a little bit short of the first down. Let's find out what's going on with Georgia and Georgia Tech. Reese? Georgia and Georgia Tech, guys, uh, been hard hitting defensive struggle all day. Deshard's choice is over 100 yards again and into the end zone. Jackets up by five, halfway through the fourth. And Pitt went to the no huddle here, and Stevens Howling will get a first down. Not a surprise to see that at all there, Ray. No, you have to pull out all the stops now. I mean, you got to make up 24 points here in 12 minutes and 12 seconds. So you, you can't waste your time with a huddle at this point. Clock stopped momentarily for the first down change being moved, but it starts up again. I haven't seen Pitt throw to Kinder very much in this half lately. And they don't hear, but they get it right about to the line with Bucus. And it looks like a first down for the senior out of Pittsburgh. Yeah, early on, Kinder was a big part of the plan, and they were getting the ball to him on a lot of quick stuff and catching Louisville and all the blitzing that they'd done. But Louisville got away from that. They started putting more people out in coverage, and they took that part of the game plan away from Pitt. And yeah, Bucus took himself away from the field, shake it up momentarily. We hope he'll return quickly. Catch was finally made by Turner, and he has a chance to go all the way, and it could be, and it is. A Panthers touchdown. 
So there is still a little bit of hope at Heinz Field. 22 yards. Tenth missed tackle of the day allowed Turner to break it into the end zone. He just ran a little hitch route out there on the outside. Pelco saw him, no coverage near, so he threw the bullet. And then, you know, the outside in cut is what really busted it loose for Derek Turner. Leon for the PAT. Forty-one twenty-four. our score. There's Turner up top. You see him just turn it around, hitch it up, breaks this tackle right here after the bobble, and then it's a foot race, and he splits a couple of defenders and gets himself into the end zone. It's not over for a second. Tanner Falco passing Dan Marino. Now he's going to have to play about three more years to get to Alexander yeah. Belt. <laughs> well, Alex had a pretty good career here as far as uh, running up the yards. And how about the guy next to Marino? Heard of him. Another small back that did well at Pitt. Part of that national championship team back in 1976. Current offensive coordinator Matt Cavanaugh, the quarterback. Dave Wanstatt was a graduate assistant on the staff here back then. And Louisville is anticipating an onside kick here. Yeah, and rightly so. And I, I, I don't know, with the 11.34 left, down 17, he might give it a try. Until the officials let you. And Louisville calls a timeout. So Bobby Petrino had some of his best receivers in there and was moving a few bodies around and just said, you know what, forget it. I'm up by 17. I've got a timeout. I am not going to take any chances here. I want to make sure my team is prepared. Well, 1976 is the glory year here in Pittsburgh. It was their last national championship, and they had a little talent, Ray. Yeah, they did. There's Mr. Dorsett, or was it Dorsett back then? I'm not sure. He kind of changed it around, but <laughs> you can change your name when you can run the football like this. I'll tell you that right now. And he was an outstanding football player, won the Heisman, and led this program to a national championship, their ninth overall. And of course, in 1976, Gerald Ford, president. I love the price of gas. Good old days, boy. Boy, not one of my favorite Wings songs, though. I've got to be honest with you. And of course, right there, Tony Dorsett. Yeah, Paul McCartney's done better than that. What's wrong with silly love songs, man? That's, that's um, a great, it's a great silly love song. Yeah, it, you're right. Silly is exactly the word. Paul kind of went soft when, uh, for a little while there after the Beatles. Well, with an update, perhaps even an opinion on which Beetle he liked the best, let's go to Reese Davis. Reese. Ringo, I think. And I need to see the May 73 banner up there. Boise State and Nevada. Boise trying to lock up a spot in a BCS game. Jared Zabransky, Legadoo, Nene, touchdown. Boise State up 31 7 late in the third. All right, thank you, Reese. So he's a Ringo man, a fan of Richard Starkey. Boy, they changed the alignment, did. Uh, Louisville in terms of protecting against this onside kick. They've got seven guys stacked over there. And George Stripling is now in a single safety position. And they do try it. It's a great kick. Didn't work though. Louisville recovers it. Tight end Barnage yep. came up with that one. You don't mess around with the hands team. Everybody who can catch goes out there, do you? I don't think anybody, even your top receivers go out there. Yeah, you got to put them out there because you have to get this football. But this is a great kick. It's the old kick down on the ball and get the high pop up in the air, and you never know what can happen. You try and get up there and maybe tip it, hit the guy that's going for it, do whatever you can, scratch and claw to get the football. But Barnage does a nice job of staying on it and then using his body to protect himself when he makes the play. They brought in Cody Sawhill, a specialist, to try that onside kick, and it didn't work. Now Louisville in position here with the clock running, coming up at the 11-minute mark. Brock Boland has done very well at that tailback spot. He's listed as a fullback, but he has been sometimes the lone back. Brom wants it all right here. And excellent coverage that time by Kennard Cox. Well, how about Bobby Petrino going for the jugular? Yeah. A little play action pass after recovering the onside kick. Everyone and their brother thought it was going to be a handoff to Boland, and he kind of faked that and tried to catch him sleeping, but they did not. Nice play by Cox. Well, there you see Brian Brown's numbers. Uh, hard to complain. 
Well, that's just the accuracy is, is what I'm talking about with him. Just five incompletions the first half, three in the second half, and he still is yet to be hit by the Pitt Panther defense. He won't be on this play, but Colby Smith will be. He got virtually nowhere. Good play there by Clint Session. Let me ask you this. this is, of the senior quarterbacks that you've seen and that you know about, who do you think is best set up to go into the NFL right now? Well, that's a... You know, I guess the guy that comes to my mind right away is Tyler Palco because he's here today and he's the guy I've been I've been looking at and I, I think he's going to go on and, and be a first day selection and I think he's got a chance to be an excellent quarterback but somebody in the West Coast system is going to get grab him up because that's what he runs. It's the same offense that the Baltimore Ravens run which Matt Cavanaugh ran when he was their offensive coordinator. So he's got a couple years in it already. I think he'll be a good one. Underneath they go and great tackle that time. Excellent play for Adam Gunn, the reserve redshirt sophomore from Vandergrift, Pennsylvania. He's had a couple of good plays in the second half. Brings up a fourth down and a rare appearance by Corey Geschke. What about Brady Quinn? Who was he tonight on ABC? Yeah, there's another no-brainer. You know, Brady Quinn is an outstanding football player, an NFL type quarterback, and I, I think he'll do equally well. So they go for the punt block. They do can't get it, and looks like he didn't make, did. Somebody actually well, deflect that. I think he did. I yep. think the ball went off. It was more of a the kicker, the punter kicked it into the the hand of the block guy, yep. as opposed to the, a, a great effort on the block. No, you know what? He just shanked it. Nobody touched him. Well, let's take a look. This is one of those shanky very much. Nobody near him. Yep. But it. It looked like a block the way that thing took off off the side of his foot. Well, that gets him a free session with his head coach. And it's a five yard punt. And you said it going into a break. Pitt isn't dead yet, but they're going to have to move very quickly. And they try right here. First down. So the Panthers get 11 yards on that play. Nate Harris on the stop. This is another reason I like Palco. His ability to run the, the hurry up offense. You know, he knows where everybody's supposed to be. He gets things lined up and then he makes good decisions on it. This is where that Brady and Manning tape must really pay off. The Genge is going safely underneath. It's Pestano on that one. And A. Brown on the stop. And the Louisville defense is willing to give Palco all the underneath stuff. The thing that they can't allow is the big play, the toss over top of their heads. So they got two safeties deep and all these guys across here in the intermediate. The three-step drop again. Here's Kinder, and he has the first down. Jackson on the stop for the Cardinals. Pitt has had a hard time scoring in the fourth quarter range just 57 points compared to the hundred they put up in the first yeah in Louisville you know they got that old dreaded prevent defense which a lot of people think prevents you from running but it's what you have to do here you can't take the chance on letting them throw it over your head yeah, that didn't work out very well for Paco at all he basically threw that one straight into the ground nobody hit him and nobody touched the pass that I could see well, another thing I've noticed, Ray, is these center snaps and the shotgun are all coming out low. Yeah, and, and looping as well. And I'm not sure what the problem with that is, but you don't expect to see that uh, consistently like we have here in this fourth quarter. Joe Milani is the center, and he has put him down precariously low to skipping them. That's a good one. Nobody open. Picked up a couple on that play. It's going to bring up a critical third down here. Koye providing the pressure. That's not a surprise. Yeah, Koye ran a stunt there, looped around to the outside, and kind of figured he was away from the play. And then all of a sudden, Palco ran right back into him. They gave him only one yard. Brings up third down and nine. And not even that, really. It's almost ten. And it looks like Louisville's going to be content to just rush four. Well, they're kind of creeping around a little bit. They like to move around pre-snap and not give that quarterback a beat on what they're really going to do. And they do come with a blitz. It's picked up, though, pretty nicely by Collins. And there's Kinder with another fine catch, but very little yardage. Going to bring up fourth down and six. Is Harris there on the stop? A sure-handed tackle by the senior out of Miami. 
you know, Dave, the thing about that blitz was it wasn't a man-to-man -man or a, a, a free safety in the middle type blitz. It was a zone blitz all the way. So, you know, you bring five. They actually dropped the, the nose tackle, Okoye, back, and then he rushed on a delayed rush. But you still play zone behind that, so you're pretty good off, pretty well off in terms of getting beat one-on-one. -on -one. Fifth time they've gone for it on fourth down. They're really going for it all here. Kinder one on one, and it's intercepted. Ah, uh, what do you do? You got to knock that down. Gavin Smart came away with a football, but he wasn't very smart about what he did. That that you knock it down, so your football team has better field position. They'll get it to the 20 instead of the 30-yard line. We'll be back. The interception for Gavin Smart, his second on the season, but maybe he should have let this one go through his fingers. Sharp. And Brian Brown, the junior from Louisville. So he comes back for another year, and the Cardinals will be well thought of in the preseason polls. Right now, they're trying to get themselves a piece of the Big East title. They can finish off the 751 left here. They will move a little bit closer, but they still need some help. They need West Virginia to beat Rutgers. And of course, they need to beat Connecticut, Louisville does, next Saturday. But West Virginia was dealt a crippling, not fatal, but crippling blow today with a loss to the University of South Florida. On the ground to Smith, who replaced Michael Bush, who was injured after the first game of the season. We know now more on Georgia Tech in Georgia. Here's Reese Davis. Dave, the dog's offense has done nothing all day against the Yellow Jackets. Inside, two minutes to go down, 12-7. Matthew Stafford, Muhammad Massaqua, touchdown Georgia. Two-point conversion has them up by three, just over a minute to go. Well, now, that yeah. would be considered an upset. I would say so. We had an interesting day. Florida State nearly upset Florida. They made the Gators play right down to the bitter end. We've had the South Florida win over West Virginia, and that one, too. And for a while here, Pitt was looking really good. Blades in on that stop right there. And it'll bring up third down. And of course, there's that big game tonight with Notre Dame and USC. Let's take a look at the BCS. Florida did win today. USC, Notre Dame. There's Louisville. Wisconsin was idle. But West Virginia, Arkansas, they're going to drop. Right. Both of those lost. And I think it, it's USC's game right now. If they go on, they beat Notre Dame. They beat UCLA then I think they're going to get that bid. Now, if they don't, then I think Michigan might sneak in there. You know, Florida still has a chance, but you know, a couple close wins. They haven't really been impressive. Arkansas it might might just knock them off, and that could. I'd love to see a rematch. I'd love to see Michigan Ohio State again. Down the middle, going to try to end the game right here with Douglas. It's a foot race, and they won't catch him. Touchdown for Louisville, 75 yards. Harry Douglas, his fourth touchdown on the year. Oh, and again, Brom, with all the time in the world, just throwing a perfect strike down the field. And didn't like what I saw at the end of that, though. Kennard Cox needs to finish that play. Yeah, yeah. That's an embarrassment. Yeah, he did, did not run that play out. You're right. I'm sure he'll hear about it from his defensive coaches and maybe even from Dave Wadstead. I'm sure he will. You know, I don't mind Douglas trotting it in, but the thing that he shouldn't be allowed to trot in, and that's got to come from Cox chasing him all the way down. PAT is tacked on. Louisville has doubled the score. Take a look at this thing from way up in the rafters. Here's your matchup right here, and it's just a go route to the middle of the field. You're going to see Cox. He's up there in that press coverage, but he doesn't really alter the route. And if you don't alter the route, there's no sense in being in press coverage because then it's a foot race and you've got your back. You're starting out backwards and you're not going to win that one very often. So you got to be more powerful with the punch of the hands to disrupt the route. If you don't do that, you're going to lose the foot race. Now, my question would be, where were the safeties? Obviously, what kind of coverage do they have there that left the middle yeah, of the field so open? Cover zero. <laughs> <laughs> it means there's zero men in the middle. Well, here's Brom in his pass chart so far. That got fattened up with that down the uh, middle of completion. Yeah, right there, the home run ball down the middle. And But you look at it, these numbers all over the place are pretty good for Brian Brom. An outstanding day, just eight incompletions, 337 yards, four touchdowns. Don't get much better than that. He is the all-time pass percentage leader at Louisville. And he hasn't done anything to hurt that today. 
Robinson and Porter back deep. And those two, Urrutia and Douglas, have just been monsters for the Cardinals today. And they came in as number one and number two in the Big East and receiving yards per game, and they didn't let that down. Trying to work his way through. Robinson not giving up, but uh, he's going to be gang tackled finally. Let's get another update on that Georgia Georgia Tech fund from Reese. Dave Reggie Ball has just had a miserable four years against Georgia. A fitting conclusion, it would appear, to his four years of futility against the Dogs. Throwing an interception to Paul Oliver. Frustration for the Jackets, but remember, they'll still play for the ACC championship next week. A minute to go just under that for Georgia to hang on for the three-point win. Of course, we don't know who they're going to play. and That'll be decided on ESPN with Wake Forest versus Maryland. 7.45 Eastern. Never would have thought that game would be for those stakes. No, that's a, an amazing story in college football this season. A little question about that. And if you want to watch that, I don't think you have to even touch the old dial, 745. Does anyone have a dial on a TV no. anymore? <laughs> I haven't seen one in a while. <laughs> Wake Forest continues to fight for the ACC Atlantic Division title. It's Ralph Friedson's Maryland team, Jim Groves, and the Wake Forest team in Deacons. Primetime, part of Rivalry Week, presented by Remington on ESPN tonight at 745 and available in high depth. And that's the first down for Pitt on H -E -S -P -N -H -D. And Tyler Palco, he's not going to fight this, uh, stop fighting, I should say. This is it for him at Pitt. There's a chance for the Panthers to get a bowl game, but it's 6-6. Six and six. Not sure if they're going to make it with five straight losses. That's really going to weigh heavily on the minds of the blazer-wearing bowl men, who are, some of them are here today. Nice toss. That's Pistano, and he is going to be ground out of bounds Tango by Gavin Smart. Well, what do you like for a, a play of the game here? What do you think? Any one in particular? Right? There's several guys that I like. I think Brahms had an outstanding game. You rooted it. Uh, Douglas. You know, I, I think there's a lot of guys that are worthy. Even Palco played pretty well. If you count the first half, Blades. H.B. Blades played outstanding at the beginning, but I'm not going to pick any one of those. All right, he'll think about that for just a little bit. There you see that field, a little bit of a factor that time on Stevens Howling as Harris, he's had a very solid game, called his name quite a bit in the second half. And you want to make sure you, your guys keep fighting, and I know that's important to Dave Wanstad, even though this might be the... You know, the last game, they may not get to a bowl game, but you, you got to develop in your program that you will fight to the end regardless of the circumstances. Plenty of time for Palco, and he hits the oats drop. Great chance there for O'Derek Turner, and he just couldn't hang on. Maybe lost the concentration just for a moment. Probably very hard to concentrate right now. Well, it is our Cooper Tires player. Oh, wait a minute. Players of the game, Mr. Bentley? Yes, I'm going with the offensive line for Louisville. The outstanding today. Uh, Jeff, or excuse me, uh, Brian Brom not hit once during the entire contest. So, Renardo Foster, Kurt Quarterman, Eric Wood, Dan, Donnie Barlow, and George Bussey. Congratulations. They're my player of the game. And Okoye prevents a first down from happening by just sticking his big body in front of the runner. So now it's fourth and short. This sixth time today the Panthers have gone for it on fourth down. You know, that offensive line, Dave, also paved the way for 143 yards rushing today. And this play never got off the ground. We mentioned at the start of the broadcast how potent Louisville is on offense, and everybody knows it. Yeah, but it all Fire to snap. Ball start. Ball start. On the, On the offense, number 75, five-yard penalty, five penalty, remains fourth down. And that all starts up front. You, you yep. can have all the, the playmakers you want, but if you don't have people knocking other people out of the way and, and protecting your quarterback, it's not going to get done. And that Louisville offensive line has been outstanding today. They, well, they've taken care of everything. They've had 11 pass plays of over 40 yards this season. Well, they can add on some more of that today. 11 runs of over 25 yards. 13 games under Bobby Petrino of over 50 points, which they still have an outside chance of getting at today. That was a good throw by Palco. That's about as good as you could have put that ball in there, but fine coverage that time against Pistano. And looks like Latarius Thomas came in there to knock it loose. You hear a little bit of noise in the stadium. That's from one section of those in the red and black celebrating what now certainly appears to be a win for their eighth-ranked Louisville Cardinals. 
And Louisville, you know, they look back on things. They had a 25 to 7 lead over Rutgers. Yeah. And they really had control of that ball game. And then they went and they fumbled it a couple of times and they couldn't get it going in the second half. That's the one that they're always going to go look back on and, and say, woulda, shoulda, coulda. Brian Brahm's day is over. Hunter Cantwell, who played two starts for Brahm after the thumb surgery in September, is in there now. Cantwell also started the Gator Bowl last year versus Virginia Tech and did very well. Well, let's see how this game impacts the Big East standards. Rutgers and Louisville. Louisville will be five and one and go to ten and one overall. But the uh, season is not over for the Cardinals. They play UConn while Rutgers goes to Morgantown. And that's the game that everyone from Louisville is going to be watching. Because if West Virginia scores the win over Rutgers and Louisville can beat UConn, Louisville goes to the BCS representing number one in the Big East. All right, so it's coming down to the the, the very wire, the last game of the year to, to determine the Big East champion. And it's going to be interesting to see how it turns out because that's that game to toss up to me. I think even West Virginia might even be favored in that ball game against Rutgers. Yeah, at home, that's going to be tough. Sergio Spencer getting some carries at running back now. You see Hunter Cantwell. In fact, I'd be very surprised if Rutgers would be able to beat West Virginia myself. I, I, and that's going to put these Louisville Cardinals, Cardinals into a BCS Bowl. Brian Brown's numbers on the day. I know his brother, the quarterback's coach, I guess he Jeff Brom. He did have a little dirt on the jersey there on the back. I think somebody must have touched him yeah. on his own team. Maybe he, he brushed against somebody in a huddle or something. I was going to say Jeff Brom is quarterback's coach, and his older brother's pretty tough on him, but I'll bet Jeff eases up on the gas a little bit, at least tonight, until film study. Yeah, and it's a fine line when, it, you know, your brother's the coach. It's a little different because your brother's before you're, you know, your coach and player. And so brothers can do things and say things to each other <laughs> that other people can't. You sound like a man with some experience. I've got a couple brothers. brothers, and they've said them to me. Not that I would say them to them. No, not you. No way. Getsy will punt. His last punt went five yards. And almost earned him a timeout with Bobby Petrina. This one's a lot better. Revis, a punt return for a touchdown earlier this year, and he just ran out of room. Picked up about 10 on the return following a 48-yard punt. And Scott Kuhn on the stop for Louisville. A lot of smiles and laughter over there on that Cardinal sideline. Came in, a potential trap game. Pitt has played well throughout the early part of the season. They have an offense that's able to move up and down the field. They avoided that trap and they're set up in a position where they want to be. What about the future for this program? You know, Dave Wanstead told us the other day out of the one, two, three, and four A classifications who all played here yesterday for their championships, Dave has the one A, three A, and four A player of the year all coming to Pittsburgh. Yeah, and I think Pittsburgh is a program that's on the rise, in my opinion. I think Dave Wanstead has a lot of things in place. I think he's an excellent recruiter. I think great coaching staff and all those things they've they've got things lined up and he's excited about it rightly so they've had a, a couple of good recruiting classes that they put together he's excited about the upcoming one and he thinks that they're on, on the bill no and Tyler Palco's last play perhaps as the pit quarterback he just got belted from behind by Malik Jackson and shaken up hopefully he will be all right this one is over it is a win for Bobby Petrino's Louisville team taking a big step toward a Big East championship with their 10th victory on the season as they knock off the Pittsburgh Panthers 48 to 24 that's our final score this has been a presentation of ESPN the worldwide leader in sports is Bobby Petrino and Dave wants have shaken their hands and off to their locker rooms they go on behalf of Ray Bentley, Vince Welch, and our entire crew, I'm Dave Lamont saying good night from Pittsburgh. Now we want you to stay tuned for the ESPN College Football Pizza Hut scoreboard. Good night and happy holidays from Pittsburgh.